Good morning. Welcome to the uh, St. Petersburg City Council meeting. Uh, uh, roll call, please. Current? You'll get the hang of it. Here. Cornell? Here. Nurse? Here. Newton? Here. Banner? Here. Curtis? Yeah, here. Kennedy? Here. Bevin? Here. Uh, yeah, here. <coughs> okay, first we'll have the invocation by Pastor Van Horn of St. Trinity Lutheran Church, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us pray. O Holy One in whom we trust, you have given us this good land and this city as our heritage. Help us to always remember your generosity and constantly seek to do your will. Bless our land with honesty in the workplace, truth in education, and honor in daily life. Save us from violence and discord, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil course of action. This day we lift up those who lead the government of the city of St. Petersburg. May those who hold power understand that it is a trust to be used not for personal glory or profit, but for the service of all people. Bless the public servants and the government of this city, that they may do their work this day in a spirit of wisdom, charity, and justice. These prayers we offer on behalf of those who make up this diverse community and especially those who acknowledge a life of faith. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor. In front of us, we have an agenda with additions and deletions. We have approval. Second. Roll call. Corin? Yes. Cornell? Yes. Nurse? Yes. Newton? Yes. Danner? Yes. Curtis? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Bedwick? Yes. Move approval consent. Second. Second. Oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to hurry. No. No, go, go ahead, roll call. Mm -hmm. Corin? Yes. Cornell? Yes. Nurse? Yes. Newton? Yes. Banner? Yes. Curtis? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Kennedy. Yes. Do we have uh, some speakers on public forum? Yes. Uh, Hugh Hullett? No, I'm not speaking. He indicated he's against the lens. And Gloria Julia? Hi, I'm Gloria Julius. I've talked to most of you individually about this project that I'm interested in. I'm an advocate for um, the bridge playing uh, population here in the city. And I wanted to uh, promote and expand the game of bridge. And there was a thing in the paper today that was real interesting. It says, um, sign up, extended for summer bridge programs. And I said, oh great, they finally got it. There's gonna be summer bridge for the kids in the school. No, it's a bridge program like for tutoring. But anyway, we do need uh, more bridge. And what, what um, I've discovered is that the city has a property on the um, western end of Central Avenue that's being used for bridge. It's a private bridge club. And the city gets $3 a month uh, to lease it to them for this. And I think that property could be put to better use to expand the game of bridge by adding rental, senior rental apartments on the parcel, along with a buffet restaurant. Food would be included in the rents. We want people to come down from up north, the baby boomers, the last generation that has sufficient income to sell their, their property up there and come down here and rent an apartment. They play bridge. There are at least 100,000 people that play bridge on the internet. And there's a lot more people that play bridge and we want them to come to St. Petersburg. We don't want them to bypass us and go to um, Boca Raton. That does have a big bridge community. We want to set this up as something new 
It's not been done in this country. There is no place now that has uh, a bridge community. What we have are communities for golf, um, just plain senior retirement facilities, nothing that's set up specifically for the bridge players. And bridge players have to get their master points. They must play and they must attend tournaments. We have to have them. If they're trying to get their life master designation, they have to be at a place where they can get sufficient uh, uh, play. So anyway, what I'm asking the city to do is to let me have a permit, permission, to explore the use of this uh, property, uh, to see if there are enough people up north who are willing to sell and come down. I have to put ads on the computer and other places where um, people who are considering moving to Florida would consider coming here to live in our rental uh, facility. This will be an upscale. This is not low income. This is, uh, does that mean something? <laughs> Your time is up. Your three minutes are up. What's that? Your three minutes are up. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know I was limited. Okay, anyway, I'm just asking for permission <laughs> from the city council to let me explore it, and then I'll come back and tell you what we found. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Gurus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I want to say thank you to Ms. Julius for her passion about the city and obviously for playing the game of bridge and for the idea. Um, I, I personally um, would not advocate or get behind any use of that particular property uh, on the west side of St. Petersburg because it is parkland, it's waterfront, and the, I don't want, at least my personal feeling is that the entrance to St. Petersburg there at Central Avenue shouldn't be a eight, nine, ten story condominium with a restaurant and other facilities. Um, however, um, I, I'd like to uh, have Ms. Julius pursue her idea for the Sunset Inn property across the street, <laughs> uh, because that building, um, I've made it, I've made it uh, privately known, and I'll make it publicly known that my first priority this year is to get something off the dime with that property. Um, it's the yellow four-story hotel at Central and Park uh, uh, that's owned by Mr. Tragos, and I would certainly support any efforts to try and get something used on that property. Um, but uh, so, so I, if if Miss Julius could find out, you know, the interest in people coming and renting, and that could provide some basis for a developer maybe to undertake something on that property, I'd be all for it. But I, I don't want to get rid of the parkland uh, that's there at the entrance to the city. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Newton. Yeah, I was going to speak on the same thing Charlie touched on. Um, she did come in and spend some time with me. And it's, it's a great idea. I think more of our citizens should be stepping up. Because contrary to popular belief, I don't know everything. I didn't get elevated to a God complex to know all and, 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 and be able to see all about this city. So I welcome your, your research and your, and your ideas. Please keep them coming. Um, uh, my um, sentiments is exactly what Charlie was talking about as to the eyesore that we just approved the parking lot for just across the street from there. As you come out of beautiful uh, scenic Treasure Island heading, <coughs> excuse me, heading uh, east into St. Petersburg, as soon as you come off that beautiful bridge, that's the first thing you see. So any improvements on that corner I think would be better than what we currently have there. So whatever we're doing, I think that um, the city need to do more. I mean, with people coming before us, asking for everything, we're giving them everything, and they're doing nothing. You know, I think it should be do a little bit, then we'll give you a little bit. But don't just keep giving, 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 because that is a, a major eyesore in that corner. It's been that way the whole almost six years I've been sitting up here and long before the end. So I appreciate you coming in this morning and sharing your ideas. Thank you. Councilmember Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you for your idea and involvement. Um, before I would feel comfortable in considering anything on things along those lines, I'd want to have some staff involvement and, and some idea from staff, so I'd encourage you to talk to Tish or the appropriate staff before anything that we could really fully evaluate. So, but thank you for your involvement. Uh, 
Ma'am, if you, if, you if you would meet with Ms. Elson and go ahead and continue the conversation with her. Yeah, I have talked to a number of people. I've talked to Wells Fargo, and they're very much interested in this. The banker himself says, gee, I know what you're trying to do. My mom and dad play bridge, and they go on a lot of bridge cruises. So says, we can, we can help you out here and uh, help you find a partner to come in uh, with this development. Well, what, what, thanks. If you, if, you would, if you would meet with Ms. Elston, who's the chief of staff, we'll, you know, we'll go from there. I'm sorry, I can't understand. Yeah, Ms. Ms. Elston. Ms. Elston right there. Yeah, doctor. Yes, I was going to tell you, when she met with me, she said she already went to quite a bit of staff already. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. So she has been talking to staff. I don't know if there's any new staff around she can go to, but she has been talking to staff already. Well, last time I checked, Tish was still a boss. Excellent. Thank you. Well, the voters Thanks. put me up here. Well, so. yes, <laughs> so whatever. Okay. Now then, since we, do we have any more uh, lights or any more cards now? Okay, so, okay, well, we are in a rare situation of being early. Uh, and so if we could go to F1, which is reports on transit. Councilmember Danner. Thank you. Well, I'll start with uh, tonight is the first of probably six or seven Tibarta E Town Hall meetings. Um, I assume I'll be out here in time to get to Tampa by six. Um, <clears throat> but they do one in each county. They um, send out 40,000 invitations to participate through kind of a robocalling and um, email blast. Um, Pinellas County always gets one of the highest participation is usually six or 8,000 people <coughs> call back and either ask questions or listen to the conversation. The other questions, you can also log in, ask questions online. So for an hour today, we'll be talking about the Tibarta Master Plan, but as usual, questions go all over the place. <coughs> Tibarta Master Plan is um, due to be updated. It's, it has to be done every other year. We've uh, included kind of a freight network plan in it this year, um, and also the uh, ports and port connectors. So um, that is moving forward um, with Tibarta. Um, Tibarta is also looking at some other things they're doing well with their van pool system. Um, a lot of people in Pasco County, it's a program you actually um, sign up and, and five or six people that work together will get a van from, from Tibarta. They, they take them home um, and, and van pool. They pay 100% of the cost of the, the fuel that covers the insurance, everything. It's a, like I said, very successful program. A lot of people in Pasco County using it to come down into Gateway into West Shore. Uh, let's see. An update also, um, the Chamber of Commerce has a transportation subcommittee now. Had an update, USF has a car share program now they've just kicked off. So the parking garage over by um, USF has two vehicles and you can sign up to be a member of the car share program and go in there and, and uh, swipe your card, take the car use it for the day, and then you're billed according to the uh, time you have it. Um, they've just kicked it off. It's already been real popular, and they're going to expand it and do it in USF and Tampa as well and see how it goes to see if there's other locations in the city that either city or even private uh, developers might be interested in expanding this, this program. Uh, PSTA, again, we had uh, the 16th month of record ridership again. Um, thank you. We're moving uh, over 14 million people a year now, so a little over a million a month. Um, <coughs> talking to Mr. Miller, our CEO, he thinks we've kind of maxed out. He doesn't think we can keep breaking the records anymore. Unfortunately, with that many riders, our on-time record is slipping because it took the uh, trolley, well, I took it yesterday or the other day to the ball game, just packed with people coming from the beach in their raised shirts. And uh, it's a good thing, but then there's so many people when you stop and 12 people get on instead of one. It takes that much longer. And sure. during the day, the people working and going to the beach, um, it really is standing room only. 
There's a neat uh, thing PSTA does. They have a um, bus buzz, and they put posts on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. And uh, our, one of our uh, communications directors was on there because a lot of people say, well, I see the buses riding around empty all day. So the time, li time lapse um, speeded up photography of the bus showing it starting out in the morning with no one on it and then five and six and seven and then st standing room only. And um, we are currently averaging on those empty buses. Saw it here. 26 riders per route per hour. So just like a road system, as the route begins, there's two or three people. As you get closer to your destination, it fills up. Then it empties when you get to your destination. You turn around, it fills back up. Um, it moves forward. We also, uh, PSGA will be finished um, probably close to the end of this month on the community bus study. What we've done for the first time in the 25 year history is actually look at the entire bus route network. It's just been kind of patched and pieced together over the years. And we're just looking if, if you had a couple different scenarios, different funding sources, but one of them is even the existing funding. Um, if you just wipe the slate clean and start it over, what would that bus system look like? A lot of the things they're looking at is the Central Avenue trolley. That when you combine three routes and go to 15 minute headways, the ridership is up 40%. So then you end up generating the revenue to pay for the increased ridership. So they're gonna look at several of those. Our most uh, highest routes, 4th Street, uh, Gulf to Bay, Central Avenue, um, the ones that go down to East Bay. There's about eight of them that are all kind of the main routes. The uh, North County Trolley that started um, about the same time as the, the combination of Central Avenue Trolley, that one also is up. That only r runs on the weekends. I think it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That ridership is three times the amount that we thought it would be, those things are packed. It goes from Clearwater Beach all the way up to Tarpon Springs. Also, the North County Flex Route started in December. These are smaller van-sized buses that they run routes in North County, but you can call ahead and the bus will actually leave its route, pull into the subdivisions in North County and pick you up at your house and bring you back into where the system is. So. Um, actually very successful, and the most successful one is one that goes um, down Tampa Road into Hillsborough County and connects to Hart, and that's the one that's the most successful. Um, like I said, overall, ridership is up 20%, despite over the last five years a $40 million budget cut um, in PSTA. So what we're going to do... Um, I'll get that second. The uh, NPO, we actually had a fairly brief meeting and got out of there in time. The good thing is the PPC now meets after the NPO, so we have to be done by 3 o'clock, and it motivates us to good idea. get our work done. We may try that here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that might work. <laughs> um, we did discuss the uh, legislative agenda. The um, Chair's Coordinating Committee put a regional priority list together with the top 10 projects yeah. in the region. Um, the 118th Avenue Connector and the Howard Franklin Bridge are our two that are on the list. Uh, most of the funding is available for the 118th Avenue Connector. Once that's complete, you could go from, I think it's Enterprise Road to over the Skyway without a traffic light. So it will certainly wow. help with North County uh, residents trying to get down here, get into the TROP, get into downtown St. Petersburg. Um, so we are, that is one of the main priorities to fund the rest of that connector to, to complete it. Um, ACPT, we had um, a presentation from, this is Greenlight Pinellas. We have a uh, branding and marketing group. We're taking all of the plans for transportation, the alternative analysis, the community bus study, the bus rapid transit route, the trolleys, combining them into one, which will be a countywide all motor transportation plan. Um, and that is called Greenlight Pinellas. We're going to um, complete those plans, so whenever someone's talking, they won't be talking about the MPO's LRTP or PSDA's TDP. They'll be talking about Greenlight Pinellas. People have a little more understanding of the program. And then also listening to the public as the plans are completed. What do you need in Tarpon Springs that's different than Palm Harbor, that's different than St. Petersburg or Gulfport? 
There's going to be several green light committees. There'll be a green light environmental committee, uh, perhaps a green light tourism committee, things like that to get input from those different parts of our population to see how those, um, their concerns and issues can be included in the plan. And then a green light council, which is um, will probably some form of the ACPT to um, have that sort of final pull everything into the plan, present it to the Board of County Commission probably by the end of this year, we're hoping in November or sometime there, to um, have a full countywide all mode of transportation plan to present to the Board of County Commission for the um, ballot in November of 2014, which I'm sure you saw the county has a resolution that they will be going to referendum um, at the November election. And then we do have scheduled um, City Council workshop. Um, we've set up these quarterly workshops, so we have a little more time than, than running through all this stuff. I'm going to show the um, MPO Advisory Committee's revenue study to show, actually they should call it the lack of revenue study, how much federal funding has been cut from the transportation budget, how much of the state funding has been siphoned off. Um, over the past few years, we had a um, Pinellas County um, funding committee in 2010 that I chaired. We looked at every funding source available for transportation, gas tax, license tax, rental car tax. So the outcome of those scenarios and, and the recommendation from that, and then PSDA's um, funding scenario. So we'll, we'll kind of have the money and then also a presentation more detail on the um, green light Pinellas. So um, with that, I will also just remind everyone at uh, 7 o'clock, you can get on to um, tbarta.com and listen in on the E-Town Hall meeting. And with that, I would request to receive and file. Second. Uh, before we do that, you've inspired a couple of folks. Uh, Councilmember Newton. Yeah, I wanted to add a little bit to um, um, Chair Danner's uh, report on PSDA. It was nice to see that uh, Hart has, all, has uh, chosen a um, mass transit site just in the West Shore area on the other side of the Howard Franklin. This is uh, hugely significant because when they do rebuild the Howard Franklin Bridge, we're trying to get them to put a, a transit envelope in there also for potential to have a, either a dedicated <coughs> lane or, or light rail. And for them to have a, a facility on the other side of that bridge is huge. So hopefully in, in, in my grandkids' lifetime, they'll be able to move more of these cars. And as to the beach trolley, someone uh, sent me a photo of um, the Clearwater Bridge going over to, on Easter, and it was wall to wall, when they even move. It was a huge parking lot from downtown Clearwater all over to the beach area. So uh, as you can see, we're not going to be able to build roads our way out of this. We've got to find a way to move a massive amount of people in one fell swoop to try to alleviate the congestions on these roads. So that's all I want to add to that. Yeah, and the uh, Hillsborough Aviation Authority is meeting this morning, and they will adopt the Tampa International Airport plan that we saw a few months ago with that intermodal center built on the site. Uh, Councilmember Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Jeff, for that <clears throat> report and all the time that you put into the uh, transportation scenario. Um, from the PSTA point of view, I think it's going to be interested in Brad Miller's given us numbers as to the ridership on routes, but he's also got, now going to report back to us as to riderships within quarters because Central Avenue has three or four routes on it. So I think the, you know, that information will shed some light as to looking at it in the quarter scenario as opposed to just which bus route has people on it. The other thing, the, uh, the green light Pinellas, I think uh, I was you know, pretty excited about the, the, the presentation. Um, and what I really want to express to, to our citizens and the citizens of Pinellas County is now is the time to get involved in this. Reaching out, looking for information. We've already done the alternative analysis um, relating to, to route for uh, light rail and the, um, the setup of where stations will be. But now is the time to get involved and, and start looking at this partake in the Tibato, um online um, home uh, neighborhood event. Neighborhood associations, if you want information from, for this, 
the green light Pinellas will, will work with it to come out to give information and more importantly, get information from you. But I think the important thing is to just know that now's the time to get involved because this is in the planning scenario. So that basically that's the, the lecture for today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Okay, with that, we have a uh, new, uh, public hearings, and the first is a new ordinance. On we need to vote. We need a roll call. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm here to roll call. <laughs> yes. Current. Always here to help. Yes. For now. Yes. Aaron. Yes. Newton. Yes. Banner. Yes. Curtis. Yes. Kennedy. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's go into that public hearing on uh, synthetic drugs. Mm -hmm. Ordinance 69H, an ordinance creating new divisions one and two in Article 5, Chapter 20, and adding new sections 20 150 through 20 154 relating to illicit synthetic drugs, providing for definitions prohibiting the possession, use, provision, sale, advertisement, display, manufacture, or distribution of illicit synthetic drugs, including spice, synthetic cannabinoids, synthetic marijuana, bath salts, synthetic cathinones stimulant or misbranded drugs prohibiting provision or sale of a product for human consumption when the product is labeled not for human consumption or contains similar warnings, providing defenses, providing for filing of ordinance and an effective date. But we have no card. Okay. Move approval. Second. Second. Mr. Wynn, do you want to share anything with us? Uh, I don't really have anything new to report on this. I made some revisions based on some uh, some discussion at the last meeting, but this is uh, an ordinance that the, uh, the, the mayor has promoted and the PD has requested that will allow them some additional flexibility in addressing the, the problem that we have with uh, different kinds of drugs which aren't specifically listed in the state's drug schedules, Controlled Substances Act. Do I understand that the effect will be that uh, whereas the uh, current state law it only only applies to those uh, versions of spice that were specified by chemical, this would allow us to sort of address them all, but it, what we would be citing people for would be a municipal ordinance violation, correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Council Member Newton. Yes, I wanted to, um, I thought I saw something here about the um, Oh, it's C9. I don't know if you wanted to throw that in there and talk about that. That's the, okay. Was that the, uh, the bill that's moving to uh, Tallahassee? Those uh, are the two bills that are moving through Tallahassee that add substances to the Controlled Substances Act. And I asked for a resolution uh, supporting the support bill. The resolution you asked for supporting those bills? That's what this is? No. 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 Well, C9 is a consent item that you already adopted, yes. Okay. So that, re that resolution just went through with that? Yes, you that, that, that was on consent. Of okay, you said you were coming back with it. I don't know if you're going to add it to this, but that's, that's all it was. I just wanted it to be more, I mean, what we're doing here is a good thing. However, that's more stringent and it covers a lot more. Well, no, it doesn't cover more. Well, that's, we, the, that's the reason we're adopting this ordinance is that the state law doesn't cover more than we have adopted here. Well, we don't want to be preempted by the state either. Correct. So that's Correct. why I was saying having a supportive resolution would be a good thing. But I appreciate you doing the work. Sure. That's member for now. Yeah, I want to say, first of all, thank you. I think this is a very creative ordinance <laughs> that is uh, well written and, and really addresses a problem. And, and the, the other thing I want to say is for anybody who thinks that we're picking on people or, or we're not being you know, fair or anything like that, um, I'm just going to encourage you to, uh, to know that um, I work with kids every, you know, Monday through Wednesday. I'm at a high school, and this is having a devastating effect. I mean, it's absolutely, I have kids whose lives are just impaired for the rest of their life because of this kind of garbage. Um, I have kids that have been in Williams Park, not because they're homeless, but because there's drugs there easily available. Um, that's a real problem. And, you know, slogans don't solve that problem. You know, if people have solutions and ideas, let's bring them forward, but, but slogans don't solve the problem, or saying the city's mean doesn't solve the problem. It needs to be about solving the problem, and I think it needs to be a fair way to do it. And I think, you know, um, th the other thing that I'm going to encourage people is use your economic power. If you see these stores that get busted for it, don't shop there anymore. 
You know, don't spend any of your money with those people. Business people, you know, when I see the kids going through, some of the kids going through either themselves impaired by these drugs or their family and what they're going through and they're going without shelter, food, clothing because their family's impaired by these drugs. Um, that, and then there's business people who do it for money, who will take money for that without ever having to see those consequences. And that's how you can do that. You just shut yourself off from that. Um, I hope people don't shop in those places anymore. And, and frankly, if they're doing that to people, um, they don't, I'll say this, they don't deserve my money. I'll just leave it at that. Um, so I appreciate the ordinance. I think it's a fair ordinance. I think it's a good ordinance. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a creative way to solve a problem. And, and um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we go into any other council members, let's go to, we have some cards from the public. Yes. Kurt Donnelly. Hi, good morning. Uh, Kurt Donnelly. I live at 2036 Central Avenue. Uh, I just want to say, I'm sure you guys have done your research, but this spice stuff is kind of horrible. I've, I've interviewed somebody who worked in the manufacturing spots for one of these. Basically, they just put plant matter in a bin, and some guy with a paint sprayer sprays this crap on there. So it could be globbed in one spot and none in another, and this plant matter could be moldy and all that kind of stuff. They couldn't care less. So I think that's why you run into the people that smoke a little bit, and all of a sudden they're a complete idiot, and some people nothing. It's because there is no quality control, and certainly it should be banned. Uh, but it occurred to me when reading your, your ordinance last night, you know, to also get around this as they change the formula issue. If you were to word it in such a manner as any substance that were smoked, vaporized, or ingested that stimulated the cannabinoid receptors in the brain, that would cover everything. So if they change their formulas, that's over with. That also would cover the issue of the natural stuff, too. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Great. Thank you. Markel Carter. Good morning. Good morning. I live at 3919 15th Avenue South. My concern is uh, last two weeks ago, we had a major incident where City of St. Pete had a police chase where as a robbery it was committed the night before, teenagers got um, killed because the cops were chasing them from a robbery that was committed on 16th Street store. The big issue is why does it have to be when the police are chasing someone in high speed, we keep getting people killed? This is not something I spoke to the mayor at Child's Park one night on Mayor's Night Out. Every time, this has been a long going and ongoing situation that finally we got death in the community. The police was out there that night. They treated us in the neighborhood like we were garbage. It's not going to take you a three minute conversation to say, this has to stop. I spoke to Mr. Newton about it, and that's why I'm down here tonight. You all are in control of this. Mayor, the officers work for you. You can control them. I sit in my front yard Monday through Friday. When they come down 15th Avenue, they treat 15th Avenue just like a Sunshine Speedway. The undercover officers, they don't care. They've ran the cars through my front yard. They come through the backyards. It needs to stop. Thank you. Steve Lasseter. Good morning. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Mama T. Lasseter, I am an ex-drug addict, but for the grace of God, I beat it. And I am concerned twofold because of where I've been, but more concerned for where our young people are going. I'm in the hood. I see what's going on. A mother called me, and I was supposed to be home on bed rest, and she was upset because her daughter was out of control, and she was just yelling, screaming, cussing at her mama like she was crazy. So I went. When I got there, I told the daughter, let's go in the room and talk. Well, when you done been on drugs, <laughs> you know the smell of the colognes, okay? She had been smoking weed, yes. But I knew that it was laced with something because I used to lace my dope. I went out the room and told the girl to go and take a shower and calm down. And I told her mom, I said, we're gonna search the room. 
Something is in here. Now, police, take me to jail if you want. We flushed what we found down the toilet. But at least that mother became aware of what's going on. Uh, I don't mean no harm, but for years I've been wondering, how is it these foreigners can come and take our meat markets, like gas stations and everything, and here we have African Americans that want to have a decent business. But you know what? Y'all need to look closer at them. It's read in their stores. See, they just want to make the money. They don't care about black folks. They don't care about people, period. All they want to do is make the money. I don't have a problem with the police doing what they need to do, because if it's to save one life, it's worth it all. Right now, that young lady, they don't say she bipolar, she going through this. What it is, once you get that junk in your system, it takes a period for it to get out. And then if you don't know the amount, and then if you've got people that's making their own prescriptions and hooking it up the way that they want, what do you get? Now, today, this is a good day in St. Pete. You all need to pass this ordinance, and y'all need to make it as tough as y'all can. But I think we need to get active like they are doing in uh, Judge Brady uh, territory and in the city of Tampa, because we are losing young people. And in the black community, it's not a black thing. It's white kids, it's Hispanics, it's people. We got to come colorblind, and we got to deal with it. They are using these little synthetic things, and they try to use it to make the marijuana last longer. But the, in, in turn, they're destroying their lives. Thank you. Any more cards? Okay, uh, next, uh, Council Member Gertz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also uh, wanted to thank Legal for a very well-written ordinance um, and uh, for the efficiency and effectiveness with which you turned this around. I want to thank the mayor for making this a priority. Um, I want to thank the police department for their efforts, not just in Williams Park, but across the city. There has been uh, an arrest made, um, and it was in my district, uh, on Ninth Avenue between 58th Street and Tyrone Boulevard as a result of an undercover operation. A store owner has been arrested. And that should send a signal, and I plan on, once this ordinance goes into effect, uh, being an undercover reporter myself, because every convenience store I go into, um, I'm going to see if they have it, and if they do, I'm making a phone call. So I want to thank you for getting this ordinance done, and without diminishing or reducing in any way the compliments that I've just given you, because they are well-deserved. And under the category of no good deed goes unpunished, I'm going to remind you when something comes up later on down the road, and it's going to take three months, I'm going to say, remember the spice ordinance. <laughs> but thank you very much for a job well done. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Council Member Newton? Yeah, I just wanted to um, add my comments that I, that I did down in the workshop and let my colleagues know and remind everybody again that what we're doing is we're, we're, we're criminalizing this this, um, this this synthetic drug or whatever they're cracking up to make it, um, it's going to make it even more valuable. As you uh, criminalize it, it's going to go under, it's going to be sold for more. I don't think people are going to stop overnight. This is only a tool, and it's only going to be as good as the enforcement. Um, While well, I support it, I, I just wanted everybody to be mindful, just like with marijuana and all the other drugs that they're trying to decriminalize, where it, starting to criminalize more, which instead of being two bucks in the store, they'll probably get 10 or 20 for it now, selling it, you know, uh, in dark corners or from under the counter or wherever else. So we'll, we'll probably drive it out of sight, but I'm saying without some severe enforcement in some of these stores, it's not going to really do much. They'll take it off the counter, but kids will still come for it, and they'll just have to pay a little bit more because of the risk that they take. So we are going to make it a little bit more. I mean, that happens. That's, that's it unintended circumstances of passing these kind of ordinances and laws. It's the same as happening in Tallahassee. It'll, it'll happen here, too, because I don't think this is going to make them stop. They'll just give our officers another tool to use to try to 
get it out of plain sight and don't make it so, I guess, grievous the way they do business. But um, we are uh, probably putting value on this now that when there was nothing there before. Thank you. Council Member Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I wanted to also uh, thank Legal and the Mayor for, for moving on this. It's, a, it's an important substance, uh, substance uh, subject to uh, address. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't see any detriment in criminalizing it, even though this is only a, an ordinance that we're passing. Um, Mark, I saw your reaction to the suggestion thought process of any effect on the brain, do you have any, does that make you want to modify anything? Well, nicotine uh, has an effect on the brain and we're precluded that, from that. You've got that, that's, that's, that's there. <laughs> okay. It's pretty well covered. I think we've covered yeah. about as much as we can cover without going too far and, and covering things like Mr. Wolf just suggested. You can't have it overbroad. Thank you. Council Member Dudley. Thank you. I, too, would like to uh, commend uh, our legal staff, Mark, in particular, for putting this together in, in, in record time. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, as, as a, an educator, you notice I didn't say retired because I don't think you ever stop educating. So, uh, you know, I've seen so many lives have been wasted by kids going out and experimenting and doing drugs and, and I'm sure a vast majority of the citizens of this community have know someone or have seen someone who they just wasted their life away because of drugs. And it's just another one of those. You have to take them one step at a time and uh, this is a good step and, and uh, I uh, <clears throat> hope we send a message out that this will not be tolerated in our community, and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we protect our young, youngsters because, you know, our youth are our future. And we certainly have got to, to do everything we can to protect them um, until they get to the age where they can start thinking for themselves in a rational manner. And uh, so anyway, Mark, Great job, and uh, Mayor, thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Just to just to, to finish on this, I think for the public, it's worth understanding that uh, this has rather the opposite effect of, of, of marijuana, which which is a essentially has a calming or whatever quieting effect. Uh, this. This seems to produce, uh, as is described here, agitation, irritability, dizziness, depression, paranoia, delusional, suicidal thoughts, seizures, and panic attacks. Not the kind of thing that we obviously you want to encourage. Uh, I mean, I, I happened to meet with the police uh, last week. I didn't realize that's where it was going. Uh, and, and an apartment owner um, happens to be in downtown north of Central Avenue. And they were having trouble with people selling uh, Happens to be a convenience store in MLK. They're selling it behind the counter, so it's, you know it's uh, and, and the police the police are, are working on this. But um, and and they were describing the kinds of effects that this was having around their apartment building, which were sort of the just sort of the the series of uh, descriptions I just mentioned. Those were the kinds of impacts they were having. So uh, uh, appreciate the uh, work on this. And w with that, we're ready for roll call. Councilmember Dana, your motion to approve is uh, the ordinance as amended? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Current? Yes. For now? Yes. Yours? Yes. Newton? Yes. Banner? Yes. Curtis? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Motion passes, obviously. Uh, new ordinances. We have uh, first reading for new ordinances. You want to? Ordinance G1. <clears throat> An ordinance approving a vacation of vacation. G1. It's approving a vacation of vacation. Huh. Yeah, we should amend that. The, of a vacation of 16th Avenue South. The of vacation should be removed. A vacation of. Right? An ordinance approving a vacation of 16th Avenue South between 3rd and 4th Street South 
and Dead End Alley remnant lying south of 15th Avenue South and west of 3rd Street South, setting forth conditions for the vacation to become effective and providing for an effective date. Ordinance G2, an ordinance in accordance with Section 2.02C3, <coughs> St. Petersburg City Charter, authorizing the grant of a public utility easement to Florida Power Corporation, DBA Progress Energy Florida Inc., the Florida Corporation with an Albert Witted Park located at 480. Bayshore Drive, Southeast St. Petersburg, authorizing the mayor to designate and execute all documents necessary to effectuate this ordinance and finding an effective date. Ordinance G3, an ordinance amending section 22 206 of the St. Petersburg City Code to amend the maximum allowable months of job participation and finding an effective date. A public hearing for these three ordinances is April 8th. Could use a motion on that. Move approval of G1, G2, and G3. Second. Roll call. Carmen? Yes. For now. Yes. Nurse. Yes. Newton. Yes. Banner. Yes. Curtis. Yes. Kennedy. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you, folks. On to new business. Uh, H1. Councilmember Newton. This is uh, re relating to uh, parking. Yes, I um, had a discussion with um, Joe. I don't know if he's here. But I was trying, but what I was going for here was we have a, this came to my attention that we have some employees who pay for parking. Um, they pay the city monthly for parking. And when they're over at other facilities on city business, if they don't put enough money in the meter, they end up with a $25 ticket or whatever. So they're paying for a space that they're not in. They're feeding the meter. And if they don't feed enough in the meter, they're paying for a ticket. So to me, it's like a double, double dipping on them. And I spoke with Joe, and he had some things that he said were available to him that I didn't know about. But I was, what I was looking for was some relief for the, the people that we have not given a raise in over four years. And, and I think if they're already paying us for parking, and they're over there on official business. Um, and, and the question came up about why, they, why they're driving their cars. And like this morning, in the climate weather, they're going to have to drive over. I mean, if we double parked in the well, I think legally has their cars parked behind ours. So they're not parking in front of a meter, but if they were, and they were up there, they might be subject to just what I'm talking about. But um, I don't know if Joe has a, a, um, a solution or a process or a plan that would help these individuals. I don't even know how many we have that pay the city for parking. Mr. Kubicki, do you have anything to enlighten us on this? Sure. Joe Kubicki, Director of Transportation and Parking for the City of St. Petersburg. And uh, yes, I did have a, con a conversation with Councilman uh, Newton, and uh, this brought it to his attention that we treat uh, city employees just like uh, any other person that comes into the downtown area, even those that may have paid parking in the buildings that they work in. For whatever reason, it's just paid parking for the building that they work in. It doesn't give them any special right anywhere else in the city to not follow the uh, uh, the parking regulations. And so we fully expect that... Uh, uh, people coming into the downtown will uh, uh, pay, uh, you know, pay for parking. If it's a metered parking, they put time in. They can get uh, reimbursement from their uh, uh, department head under a, uh, um, a reimbursement policy. So if uh, if they're told to come downtown and uh, and conduct business, uh, we expect them to be treated just like any other person that comes downtown to to do business. And so that's the way we handle it. And uh, if they happen to get a ticket, it's their ticket. Uh, if for some reason uh, uh, there may have been an extenuating circumstance, they need to work that through their department head. We certainly don't uh, waive tickets for employees because they come downtown and uh, happen to park and over overtime park. Let me get this straight. Um, we have employees paying the city for parking. Then we have those employees going to other city facilities for official city business. And we're going to hit them with a ticket if they don't put enough money in the meter? For instance, I pay $40 a month to pay in the MSC building. Right. Uh, that's that's parking for for me and my work. I Before I came here, I was a consultant. I paid for my parking in uh, the parking lot at the, the business I was at there. That doesn't give me any special right to go down on the waterfront and assume that because I pay to park in the MSC building that I wouldn't have to pay along the waterfront. I still have to pay for parking uh, in other places, just like everybody else would have to do. Well, let me, I'm, I'm trying to be clear. I'm not talking about the waterfront. I'm talking about another city facility uh, where we have, they're, they're doing city business, not just driving onto the waterfront. And, um, and they're already paying. And again, these are people that have not gotten a raise 
over four years. So they're paying for parking, but, they're, they're, but because of the requirement, they're required to leave where they got paid parking at and go to a place where they don't have paid parking and pay, and immediately they have it, but if something runs over and they subsequently get a ticket, that, and you're saying it's their ticket, or they're supposed to get with the department head and they work it out, or is this some kind of... No, let, me, let, me, let me try to clarify, and I'll be, I'll be very clear. The employee pays for parking in the building or where the garage or where the lot is uh, in proximity to their building. But we treat our employees no differently than somebody else who has paid parking because they work at a bank in Southport, but they have to drive to another bank or branch or whatever, even if it's their official business. Now, what we do, do is we will reimburse them for all out-of-pocket expenses oh, okay. incurred. So whether it's mileage and they keep track of mileage because we stopped the stipends, okay. uh, or if it's quarters in the meter, we will reimburse them. So there's no reason not to have a roll of quarters. And, and I'll tell you, I, I hate parking meters. I think we all hate parking meters, but it's that necessary evil to have that turnover so all of the businesses along Central, around the MSC, around the way, wherever, have that turnover over, over of parking for patron availability. But if they put in a dollar for an hour, we reimburse them for that. So okay. there's no reason not to, you know, over, over quarter, um, you know, they shouldn't get tickets. And, okay. and I don't so get, people, and, and I, I rarely have instances where I get a complaint. So the people have, um, um, they have a, it is a means for them to get reimbursed, whatever money has been on official city business. Yep. And, and that brings me to the meters, like even right now, um, we have a, a, a host of meters down front of City Hall. And they have people coming to, to visit with me on, on meetings, and they have to cut it short or abruptly get up and run downstairs to feed a meter. Is there any relief for the people coming to their house to, to talk to their elected officials? Do we, do we have to tax them on a meter or charge them? We have a large sign right there when you park. It says on days where there's an official meeting of City Council that's on the, uh, the meeting list that parking uh, – um, parking over in lot four is free to anybody who wants to use it. So anybody that's here today um, can park over there and uh, and they don't have to feed the meter on days that are city council days or other meetings when we're in other days that we have official meetings here. Well, what I'm talking about is an official meeting on a calendar with their elected official and they have to pay to come to see us. And if there's not enough money in the meter, they will have a $25 parking gift. Are we doing anything about that or do we do anything about that? No. No. Yeah. Okay. So we just tax them to come see us. It's just or you like can any go other see them or go somewhere where there's free parking. Oh, this is this is their house. They want to come to City Hall. It belongs to the people. And I'm just saying that yeah, you, you say you hate meters, but they got them all in front of City Hall now. And the people have to pay to come to City Hall to talk to their elected officials or uh, whether a, a fine of $25 on a scheduled meeting that's on a calendar, harvest meeting, within, with, their, with their local elected officials. If it's a scheduled meeting on the calendar, the parking is uh, provided for free in Lot 4, and there's a sign to that effect. So anybody coming down to official meeting today or any of the other meetings that you all hold that are on the calendar, they can do it for free, and, and we've got a large sign that says do that. I, I if they're just coming down to City Hall to see me or to see anybody else, it's like any other meeting, and we are trying to manage that parking, and they do have to pay the parking meters. Uh, we have another light. Council Member Gervins. If there's um, I mean, let's say the employee goes to a meeting someplace and they, they put their quarters in, they put two out, let's say they put the max in, and their meeting runs over two and a half hours or something. Is, is there a policy that they can, they can go tell their supervisor, you know, my, my meeting ran over, I couldn't go put more quarters in? There's absolutely there's a, poli a policy written policy to that effect that they can go to their, the supervisor, uh, their has supervisor and then to their director and then the director comes to me and we adjudicate, we decide whether it was, it was legitimate. People have to give presentations, things like that. They can't possibly get out right. to do things. They're always extenuating kind of circumstances and we have a, a mechanism for that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and it's all common sense, but if you want to assure that nobody can park in front of City Hall to meet you on non-meeting days or anything else, we just won't meet her and it's free. And then every attorney, paralegal, uh, courthouse worker, a uh, juror will park in front of City Hall because it's unlimited and that's No, I, I, I get There's that a part. reason why even in front of our house, uh, there are a lot of other houses, the state building, the county building, and a lot of offices 
that uh, people would love to have free unlimited parking. I, I, not, I completely get that part. I'm, I'm relating to, I go to a hearing at the courthouse, I put my $2 worth of quarters in, and my hearing runs over. And I come out and there's a ticket on my car. Um, that gets charged to the client, frankly, because that, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, it's a you know, $25 yeah. ticket, but the hearing went over. I had to be at the hearing. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm asking is, is there a policy, and you've said yes, where the supervisor has discretion if something like that happens, it's a reimbursable expense. That's correct. Because it wasn't laziness. It wasn't forgetfulness. There was something going on, and they had to stay. And they were on official city city business doing well, yeah, it. But yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's a there's a mechanism. There's always a mechanism to appeal, and we get not very many of those, by the way. Uh, we get a couple of them every few months, and uh, uh, that that happens. And I talk to the director of that department. If it's legitimate, yeah, we'll waive it. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. We we have a card on this. Yes, we do. Tom Kelly. <laughs> Tom Wiley, uh, down uh, 31st Way South. How many free parking spots are in Field 4? Uh, on days like today, all of them are available. Uh, so uh, you don't have to pay the parking meters over there. There's probably 30 or 40 parking meters over at that location, but there's a lot of employee parking too. The, but, sign, the sign says only parking in this row. It doesn't say any place. Hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll look at it again and see if there's. It, it, is anybody here experiencing an, an inadequate number of parking spaces? Yes. Thank you. I'll, I'll take a look at that. Councilman Yes, I, I just wanted to um, uh, let the mayor know that I, I'm, I'm not looking for free parking for everybody, but it was. Um, and as, as to your thing about turnover, this was two hour limits signs down there, so people didn't get to stay there all day and get free parking. It was. Um, uh, it's just a matter of uh, if, if your concern was to turn the parking over, not to gouge the people to come to the elected official, then those two-hour limit signs were just fine. But uh, someone in the infinite wisdom took them out and stuck in meters, and now it's costing them money to come to the elected official, and that's a fact. Um, it, we have two-hour signs or not one-hour signs throughout the city, but in front of City Hall, I think it's, um, it's not a good look to have the people that put us here have to pay to come see us and worry about getting a $25 parking gift when we can do two hour uh, or one hour signs if we're worried about turning over spaces. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councilman Dudley. Thank you. Uh, not to belabor the point, but I'll tell you, uh, <clears throat> you know, we're, we have a parking place. We park in the back. I had another car the other day and I came to City Hall, parked up front, put my quarters in the meter because that's I couldn't get in back there because I didn't have my car. So, uh, you know, it's just it's just the way it is. You know, I, I understand. And uh, I was laughing because the last ticket that I got, I, I never had a parking ticket until I got on city council. <laughs> and I've got five. And the last one I got was rather unique. I'm standing and making a presentation with a microphone in my hand as a gal's writing my ticket, a parking ticket. Okay, just that's just the way it is. And, uh, it, there's a place provided. If I can use it, fine. If I can't, just like everybody else. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Newton. Yeah, this you, is my new you, business you, you item. Got a, you got a minute. This was my new business item. I would appreciate it, Joe, if you do post how many spaces are over there in plain view, so the people going over there can see it. And also, if there's a procedure in place for the employees who pay, maybe stick that in with their invoice or let them know what they can do if, they are, if they're on official city business and they incur some of this. Because as we saw this morning, there's a lot of stuff that's assumed and not published, and some of it's really not happening. Absolutely. I'll work with Gary Cornwell at Human Resources and make sure that uh, people know what their, what their options are. And quite frankly, I didn't know there was a problem over there, but I certainly will check it out and we'll make sure that there's going to be adequate parking over for, for people coming into this. Thank you, Councilmember Newton and Mr. Kabicki for working on that. Thanks. Uh, next, there was a new business item on re re related to a peer workshop on the 18th. Uh, this was a request on my part to schedule a, a workshop uh, on the 18th. And my hope on this is to, uh, is to deal with what I would consider to be sort of the technical issues 
not the aesthetic issues, but but there are there are some technical issues that I think would be helpful if we could try to see how many of those we could get resolved. <clears throat> Sometimes you think of it, you know, you've, you've got a complicated problem and you've got 15 questions, but if you can get five or six or seven of them out of the way, it makes it a less complicated issue. And so that was my that was my interest. Uh, and so that is a request to schedule a workshop to deal with uh, technical issues and, and to request the, uh, the group that's been organizing against it to, to share with us, you know, their concerns. I mean, I've, I've had people talk to me, want clarification, have we worked out fire codes? How are we dealing with pedestrian safety versus the trolleys and the fire trucks? You know, we, uh, we obviously need to have a higher level of assurance that uh, the aluminum and steel issues are, 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 you know, that we have a comfort zone that that's going to all work out. And then, we, you know, we may, and, you know, depending upon timing, you, 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 there, it may be an appropriate time to discuss scheduling referendums and stuff, but we'll have to see, you know, in two weeks where we are on that because uh, one of my selfishly, I mean, I, th I think it's in our interest to, to not have three elections in the, in, in, in the next six months. And so depending upon how this works out, we could end up being forced to have a, another election which would cost us a quarter of a million dollars. So that would be my request. Uh, Council Member, do you have a light? Yeah, I was just wondering, is this, um, is it, when is it, I guess, the next milestone that we spend more money, um, I guess, going after this, um, whatever it is, it's not a peer, but is that is that around the 18th or is that it's coming up soon? It's going to be uh, uh, the first part of May, two weeks later. Oh, so two weeks after this is when they uh, look to spend more money yeah. on on that, that project. Um, I just want to uh, be, be mindful that we do have a, a lawsuit pending, um, a judge decision. We also have another group that's vigorously collecting petitions. That from what I understand, I've, I've met with them. That is going to go to a ballot. Um, I don't know where this train is heading, but I, I, I just, um, <laughs> I wish we had did the right thing as a body and let these people vote. I really do. It's, um, I, I got a, the other day I got my water bill and got some propaganda in it about the new uh, alleged pier. Had nothing about dollar amounts, none of that. Just a pretty colorful brochure. And what we can call and what we can go on the website. It's, uh, we're spending a lot of money, and the people that's got a total role and suffer with this, whatever it may end up being, are, are left on the sideline. But it's, um, it's coming close. I know on August 27th, it, it's going to be, uh, an election with, um, we have, I guess, a mayor and four council members on that ballot. Uh, that's coming up quick. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, what this is and what this you're proposing and, and, and where is it going? Well, the intent was that we would we would meet on the 18th, try to address some of these what I describe as technical issues or sort of functional issues, and see see if we could get some of those resolved. It's it's not a you know the the issues of aesthetics and, and whether it's worth spending the money. That's not that that is not something that is going to be resolved in a workshop. People will have an opinion about that, but but there are a number of these things that can actually be. Boiled down to fact, you know, does it meet a fire code? Okay, the, you know, those, those 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 kinds of issues, and try to try to work out some of those. It's the, reason, of, the reason I asked you that, I got a minute twenty-eight left, is um that I saw in the paper this morning that no one responded to the uh, the restaurant RFP that we already solidified for the Columbia. And I'm wondering, are they going to be in this meeting because they're negotiating with the city right now on waterfront property that's supposed to be protected by referendum? Uh, that that was not my request. They're not going to be in this meeting. It's just a workshop for the people with the petitions and 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 who else? Well, our, you know our staff and you know um, uh, Michael Maltzen is going to be in town that day, I believe. And you know so that there would be, you know, the hope would be we, we'd be able to get some answers. On some well, of those well questions. the paper say Maltzen's meeting with Columbia, so I guess he's uh, if he's going to be there. Well, I guess like everybody that's investing money has got a stake in this. Probably should be in there too. I'm just throwing that well, out. That's what, this is what, what, my, what my request is. We have a couple of cards. Yes, we do. Ed Montanari. Well, good morning. Uh, Ed Montanari. Uh, I live in St. Petersburg. I was vice chairman of the uh, Peer Task Force. I'm against uh, having this workshop 
for uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one of the things I wanted to review was the process that we've we've gone through. We started back in 2008 with a series of five months of visioning with with the people, and then uh, in 2009 we had a intense peer task force that met for 14 months, 63 meetings, three public hearings. Uh, Four consultants. Uh, we presented our report to you. You all studied it for another year. We then had a international design competition. Invited the best uh, architects in the whole wide world. We had a winner by unanimous vote of a jury. Uh, Michael Malson has been hired by the city to do a uh, go through a process, and he's doing what we've asked him to do. So he's coming up on a critical report that's scheduled for May the 2nd, and this workshop is going to preempt that report. And I don't understand why you would do that and why you would kind of single out one group and address their concerns. I don't have any problem with public input. In fact, at the first meeting of the peer task force, I advocated to have the public speak at every one of our meetings and our subcommittee meetings. But to preempt your architect with a workshop, I just don't understand why you're doing. Let him do his job. Let him make the case, address any concerns that you have, uh, and then move forward. I think this is a case of putting the cart before the horse. And, and you all have a good process in place. It's been well thought out. It's been thorough. Stay the course. Let's show some leadership. Thank you. William Ballard. <coughs> William Ballard, 1255 Brightwaters Boulevard, uh, here representing concerned citizens. As <coughs> you are aware, uh, it is a very high probability, approaching certainty, that you will have a referendum this summer. And as you are well aware, our group uh, has put in a great deal of time examining the premises under which many of your decisions have been made. Our group has identified clear issues such as the contest winning design having bridges that could never be built because they did not conform with the state fire prevention code, at least the overwater bridge. There are a number of <coughs> issues. I use that as an example. That one, I understand. You will, we hear there will be another iteration coming up. It may be uh, that we have too great a, a view of our competence and expertise, so we apologize. But we believe that we can help you assess the risks associated with the next dollar or the next million dollars that you propose to invest. We believe that we are the only people who will test what is being presented to you by the team that is benefiting from this contract. We're volunteers. Now, yes, we want to stop the lens. Take that as a bias. I'm just like the expert witness from the other side, Mr. Gerties, Mr. Kennedy. But listen to us. And we also hope this is an opportunity for individually you all to jump in, talk to us, talk to your own experts, cross talk, have a conversation, and you need time to do it. Thank you. Elassiter. Mama T. Lassiter, grassroots community activist. I sat there and I thought, 
I've heard everything about the pier and the lens, and I don't think I've ever shared with you all anything. I understand the rationale that they say the current pier is corroded and it needs to come down. I, I, I get that. And I don't have a problem with it because I thought it was ugly when they put it up, and I didn't think it fit our character. I do not like the new lens, but I don't like the way that y'all rush to do things, and I don't think you're doing it in the name of the people or our interests. Now, I felt you all should have put it on referendum. That would have saved the lawsuit that Kathleen got y'all going through now. But the thing is, y'all not stopping to think about all the citizens. While I can appreciate Ed Montanari, nothing personable, but see, they keep inviting you to the table. I'm here serving the community every day. They've never asked me. You have never asked me to sit on the task force. I personally think y'all should have got the guy, you know, that go all over the country and build homes for people that done got sad stories or have been through things, okay? I think y'all should have brought him and let him design what we need. Not only that, we got nuggets right here within our city. Now this workshop, I think you got the cart before the horse chair. I don't mean no harm. Y'all need to go ahead and let the judge rule on this thing with Kathleen. Then y'all need to search yourself to decide if y'all are just going to go ahead and tell the people, we're going to go ahead and put this item on referendum and let the people decide. It ain't no sense for y'all to keep sitting up trying to make decisions for us when you're not including everyone. This city is compiled of all people. More than just the little handful that y'all want to just keep picking out every time. Y'all not ready for no workshop. Y'all got a legal issue hanging out there. So why would you even try? But you know what's really sad? Y'all supposed to be leading us. We are so sick of the way y'all keep taking digs at one another. Either you're going at the mayor or you're going at one another. Life is short. <clears throat> Y'all need to put this foolishness on hold. Y'all don't need to do nothing until legal tell you what to do. <clears throat> okay, no more speakers, but we got lots of lights here. Councilmember Danner. What's our next scheduled meeting with the Malton Group? And didn't, didn't we have one scheduled for about this time? We tentatively had scheduled on April 18th a uh, report to City Council on the schematic design phase and how we address concerns that were raised during the basis of design phase. And at this juncture in time, uh, we have deferred that to the following meeting. And as much as uh, our construction manager at risk, Skanska, is uh, confirming our cost estimates based on the uh, schematic design. So there's a there'll be a workshop scheduled then the 25th or that week of the 25th. You said the week after. No, the what's May, May 2nd, oh, May 2nd would be the time frame we're currently scheduled or currently desiring to come back to council to report back the schematic design phase and request authorization to commence with the detailed design. Okay. I, to me, that seems like the logical time to have a workshop. we got one scheduled. They're going to be in town. They're going to be prepared. Um, I met with the group that wants to stop the lens, and um, we, we, we did listen to that. We listened to people that wanted a casino out there. We listened to people that wanted an aircraft carrier out there, a Golden Corral restaurant, and um, there was a lot of options. And uh, I think uh, at where we're at now is to, to move forward. We've got the workshop scheduled. Um, um, and, and when I met with them, I asked them, I said, if, if we resolve the engineering questions, are you going to be satisfied? And, you know, the answer is no. They're going to, you know, then they have concerns about the TIF funding or about the programming or about, so it'll, it'll never stop. They just don't want the project to move forward. And I respect their opinion. I respect their ability in our charter to collect the petitions to do that. But I don't think we need to schedule another workshop two weeks ahead of one that we had scheduled already. So I'll be opposing this. I should clarify that 
we don't have a workshop scheduled for May 2nd. He said he, said he has a report to Council on May 2nd. To report. Yeah. <laughs> but we, can, we can certainly accommodate well, we can, any, okay. any request that you have. Okay. Uh, Council Member Gertis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I want to thank you for um, bringing this up. I think it's a good idea. Um, and, and Mr. Montaneri's right uh, about the process and um, all the things that the City Council, before I was on and since I've been on, has gone through. I, I totally disagree that it was a rush. Um, it's been going on since 2008, as Mr. Montaneri said. But, but I think this is a good idea because it's specific to the technical issues that have been raised um, by various people. And I, I just feel very strongly that we ought to invite scrutiny. We ought, to, we ought to be able to say your questions are welcome, despite whether we think they've been answered or not. We ought to welcome scrutiny on these technical issues. We ought to hold our contractor, the architect, the engineer, the construction contractor, the construction manager accountable for being able to answer or go get the answers for these questions. If we can't do that, then there, to me, uh, there's a weakness in the justification. I don't think there is a weakness. I'm not afraid of the scrutiny. Um, and I, I think, again, we ought to welcome it. Secondly, and, and maybe more importantly, since, since Everybody thinks it's certain that an election's coming, and I'll take that for granted. It is extremely important that the people who vote in that election are educated. Because I can tell you from the polling I've seen and the questions I've seen and the comments on the Times' website on articles where you see people saying things that are completely made up as far as I'm concerned, the more education we can do publicly about the facts, like the chairman just said, about the facts and get the facts out, um, I, I think it, it is going to support the outcome that uh, those of us who have been voting yes uh, have been moving along. And, and it would be my intention after this workshop uh, and after these facts are established and the scrutiny is responded to, I'm going to have another town hall on the west side because I'm going to make sure the people on the west side know what was done at the workshop. I think education and scrutiny is helpful, so I'm going to support it. Thank you, Councilmember Curran. Thank you. Well, I would agree with Councilmember Gertis. I think that um, scrutiny and questioning is a good thing. I don't believe this is the way to do it. I mean, even reading the background that we got from the chair about this issue, I mean, it was said that administration voiced concerns because experts wouldn't be available today to answer any questions, so we'll have it on the 18th when council didn't approve having a workshop to begin with, and it wasn't called by it, administration. I think, you know, I've, I've been in this process from the beginning. It did start in 2008. Every single member of the public has been invited to every meeting, as Ed Montaneri just stated, every meeting had open forum, every single peer task force meeting. And the ironic part about that is the one person that really participated the most with uh, giving input was Lisa Wanamaker, and now she's part of the team. I don't think this is a time to have any type of workshop. I don't think it's appropriate just to call in one group. No offense to stop the lens. I mean, I meet with you. I talk to you all the time. My next door neighbor is Dan Harvey, so I certainly hear enough about what's going on with everything. But there is another group out there. So we have stop the lens and save the pier. So what's, what's fair is fair. But we're going to have the uh, final for the uh, schematic design on May 2nd, that's an appropriate time to discuss anything. I think if you all, whatever questions you have, get them all out in the public. I know you've got your list. No matter what is said by city staff, you're not going to agree with it anyway. So I'm sure that maybe some member of the public 
will know much more about aluminum clad steel than any of our experts that we have hired. So I think you really have to consider what process we are taking and who are the experts that we are going to listen to. That's why we went through the construction manager at risk process, why we've got them involved, and why we need to just continue. Whatever happens with the petitions is going to happen, but in the meantime, I'm not willing to throw away the five years of work that we have done. I chaired the International Design Competition jury. We did start with 23 proposals. Somehow people out there are saying we only had three, <laughs> and out of those we picked one. That's not what happened. And as Councilmember Gerda said, the biggest thing now is educating the people. I think whatever the city put out in the <coughs> utility bills was not propaganda, it was education. And I found that um, just coming by my business, a woman that came in that I asked how she liked the lens proposal, she did not like it. And the reason she didn't like it was she didn't want one dime of her tax dollars going to pay for that pier because she lived on St. Petersburg Beach too long for her tax dollars to go to that. And then I tried to nicely remind her that then if you live on A, there is no St. Petersburg Beach. It's St. Pete Beach that was changed years ago. And B, not one dime of your tax dollars is going to the pier. So I think, you know, you can sit there and say whatever. We've discussed this in a friendly fashion and we'll continue to do that. But I think we're really putting the cart before the horse and we need to have that workshop and then go forward with this. Councilmember Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think first it's important to acknowledge that we've had a very thorough process that has, has gotten us here. Um, and back to the discussion of green light Pinellas, get involved early so that we don't have those discussions at the very end and people feel that they were not consulted. My biggest concern is what we do if that process stops. We lose a lot of credibility. Um, and, and then where do we go from there? Because if we have another design competition, who's going to apply? Um, so so that's, that's one of my biggest concerns in that respect. Um, I'm in favor of more information. I'm in favor of additional education. Um, I don't think having this workshop is going to throw away all the work that, that has been done. Um, but I want to be very careful that we don't wind up throwing all the work away. Um, I like the idea that it's limited to technical concerns and it's not limited to what it looks like. And I understand that there's certain people that are going to dislike it because of what it looks like, what it has, what it doesn't have. But the fact that we're staying with technical concerns makes me want to support this. I am somewhat concerned on, on the selection of who is going to give us technical information. Um, obviously referring to experts in court, before they become an expert in court, they have a CV and they have the educational background and they have the ability to give us an educated opinion. Um, and that's, that's my biggest concern here is what is the expert foundation for any opinions that we would get? I am very comfortable with staff and the team that we've hired as to they having the ability to give us expert opinions. Um, so so that, becomes, that becomes my quandary and I would ask that anybody that is giving us information that we get a CV, that we get something to say this is why this person has that knowledge to attempt to educate us. Because sometimes when you're evaluating opinions from different experts, 
what it comes down to is the knowledge of the expert and why they would know what they would know and, and, and the basis of it. Um, when we're talking about the technical concerns, um, when we're, <laughs> You're right. When we're talking about the technical concerns, I want to make sure that those technical concerns uh, include safety, um, because I'm still trying to visualize the the trams, the bicycles, and the pedestrians all in in one place. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna support this. I don't want my support for this workshop to any way. Um, mean that Mr. Machinari and all his group and everybody that do has done things in the in the past that somehow we're undercutting it. I see it as a way of getting more information. I just want to make sure that the information we're getting is, is solid and reliable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Council Member Cornell and then the Mayor. Yeah, well, a few, a few things. First of all, let me point out, I was in a meeting Monday at Lake Vista about an addition to Lake Vista. And they had a computer drawing, and the architect said, well, anybody can do this. This is, So don't, don't think this is set in stone. This is very simple to do. <clears throat> and we really do want your input at this point, just because you're seeing a, a computer rendering of it. Um, and nobody batted an eye. And they were talking to fire codes, and they, were, and they didn't have schema, you know, final construction drawings. It's the process. <clears throat> the difference is, a lot of times the public is not as involved in the process, but the idea that somehow because it's going through the exact process that it's gone, I've seen other, dozens of other projects go through in the city, somehow it's a flawed process, I don't agree with. Um, the idea that we're gonna settle fire codes in a workshop with council, I don't get that at all. Um, council doesn't make fire code. Council doesn't regulate fire code. That will be a permit that will be drawn that will not be approved if the fire code's not there. I mean, some of this discussion is good, and some of it, I think, has been really counterproductive. And the counterproductive part is when we say things like, um, they won't meet ADA code. Look at this, it doesn't meet ADA code. There will not be a permit issued that does, it's illegal to do that. There will be, there are people who approve those plans who will say, no, no, that's, that doesn't meet ADA code, you're not doing it. That's pretty basic. And to impugn people that have worked for the city for years and years and done good work, but now all of a sudden they're not trustworthy because they're the city, I really have a problem with that. It's really unfair. Um, what I am open to, and I said this last time, is if I reach the point where I feel that there are concerns, um, I'm not sure bringing in the group that is completely against the lens is the right answer, but what I think could be the right answer is to have a peer, professional peer review. If I reach that point, that's what I would ask for, but the idea that, um, that council's gonna regulate fire code, we don't do fire code. I don't know that we have experts. I'll give you an example. Laura Brock is here, she's our auditor. She is a, a incredibly talented, smart woman. She's not, she's a certified auditor, all kinds of credentials, I've seen her, her, her CV. I would not ask her about the aluminum cladding for the lens, I would not. And that takes nothing away from how smart she is. There are people with financial backgrounds that, are, that, that would have good input on the, the financial aspects of the project, but wouldn't necessarily have, you know, are not experts on the aluminum siding. Um, our staff cited the Army Corps of Engineers. That's a fantastic resource, and I'm, I'm going to be waiting to hear the details of that. What the Army, the Army Corps of Engineers is a good resource for that. You know, I'm going to listen, so I'm going to listen very carefully, but I, th I have a problem with implying that because um, somebody's doing something for the city, they're automatically lying. I don't believe that, that that's accurate. I have a problem with... I have a problem with saying things like, I mean, I've heard this a lot, and whether it was the five people here today, but, but the, the group has said over and over again, the city can never do anything on budget. What I'm gonna challenge on that, that's very cynical and very counterproductive because the people that are part of this project have a 30-year history, a 25-year history with uh, Penny for Pinellas. Show me one project that the city didn't complete. 
even when the economy went down, which as it has in the last few years and adjustments had to be made, projects are being done. Um, so now to say to that these people, we don't trust you because you're just saying things that you want to say. Um, these are people's professional lives. The, the final thing I'll say is anybody that I'm going to take as an expert, I want them to put their name on it as a professional expert and put their professional reputation because that's exactly what Lisa Wanamaker, Michael Malton, Parsons Brinkerhoff have done. And a lot of the other ones like Archer Western have not done that. We're not willing to do that when you talk to them. So I want somebody who's signing off on it, not somebody who, you know, who's signing off and saying, as my profession, I'm putting my name on this. And for me, if I have the questions, what I will ask for is a peer review. But I think having the idea, and the idea that this is going to stay just on technical, we've already said, well, we might talk about scheduling referendums. So it, that's not a technical issue. Um, and as far as the referendum goes, I'll just say this. Council does not have the authority to, to, to um, reject a referendum that's a legal referendum. So when you get your petitions, if in fact that happens, which you know I'm, I have no reason to doubt, doubt your word, but that's your word that it will happen, the timing of that is up to you. Um, but I think it would set a very bad precedent for the city to now start negotiating like that. Um, with a five-year process behind it, with a year's worth of meetings that people were invited to that any of you could have participated in and probably could have been on the task force if you had requested. Um, I think, but I don't think that, that engineering reports are something that can be questioned. I mean, I respect that the public may disagree with an engineering report, but I think for me, it's going to have to be another engineer with the same qualifications challenging an engi engineering report. Um, so I'm open to the idea of listening. I've met with you every time you've asked me. <clears throat> but this idea that council is going to, to work out fire codes or council is going to decide, there are laws in place that regulate that. There are permits that have to be obtained that regulate that. It won't happen. The permits won't get approved if it doesn't meet fire code. But it won't be Steve Cornell regulating that or telling you what's right or wrong about that. It would be the fire code marshal that decides that. And I think that's appropriate. I think that's perfectly appropriate. So I will be against this workshop. Thank you. <clears throat> Administration is prepared to assist council in any way that it needs to be informed, to have the facts, to go out and advocate one way or the other. Um, we need to inform you. We need to inform the public. And we, I just want to make sure that you are always prepared because not one penny will be allocated without at least five of you saying, it's okay, let's move forward. So we are prepared. Now, a, a, a workshop, depending upon how it's, it's formatted, I mean, a debate is not going to be the answer, but, but I don't mind making sure that we are prepared to answer any questions that you have that come up. You, you have been asking, some of you have been asking their questions the whole time, and I'm okay with that. Um, it's interesting, and Council Member Cornell brought up a lot of what I was going to say. When was the last time we built a significant structure in the city of St. Petersburg using taxpayer money without a permit, or that fell down, or that blew away, or that didn't meet certain standards? I not in my lifetime, I don't believe. Now, I could be wrong. Some of you are older than I am. <laughs> I could be wrong, but I don't believe so. So, and, and how many times have you heard in conversation at Publix or Home Depot, man, I was working on that building and darn that fire marshal. Um, and sometimes you hear that because, yeah, we can come up with defendable positions for a lot of uh, the building code, but... You know, the fire marshal has two notebooks that are that thick that they take very seriously. So, you know what, turning radiuses or whatever is required to get equipment on and off is going to be a pretty big deal. And whether it's health, safety, fire, ADA compliance, DEP, all of these things will, will be resolved. There's not a single, and I'm speaking out of turn, but I'm going to go on a limb, there's not a single scientist or engineer up here. 
and I know Charlie worked for Raytheon, but I don't think you were an engineer. No. So <laughs> we're going to depend no. upon a lot of smart people to figure out how aluminum meets with steel and, and how the Navy did it with that suit, with that cargo ship that came in that was all steel, but or all, met, or all aluminum, but had steel fixtures. And we're going to have to rely upon a lot of information, but we will have it. And the construction manager at risk has to feel comfortable that they can build it within budget because all of you have told us if it can't be built within budget, it's not going to be built. And we mean it. So we're going to do that. But to think that to think that we're creating this wing that's just going to fly away without doing some type of wind tunnel, wind tunnel testing um, and testing on the way metals merge. And, and again, we're going to rely upon a lot of smart people. Will we rely solely upon the expertise of the people we're paying? No, I don't think so. I think it might behoove us to go out if, it, if that's required to seek an independent analysis. And I'm hoping he, he's not here today, but I'm hoping he doesn't deny the conversation. But Mr. Risser said he would pay for it. And I said, well, if it's extravagant, we'll help. <laughs> but um, when it talks about the, the metal aspect. So there's a lot of concerned people who are spending their own money to make sure that we do it right. And we're absolutely grateful for that. But um, we still have a ways to go. And we will answer any question that you have or that that any group, whether it's save the lens, save the pier, um, build the lens, build something else. We're going to make sure that whatever questions are forwarded, we're going to have the answer because we have to inform, we have to make sure that you're armed with facts, that the public is armed with facts, because yes, if the signatures are obtained, there's going to be a ballot question, and it's going to be that question. We're not going to wordsmith it. It's going to be that question. So we got to make sure people are informed. But we'll be prepared um, to answer any questions that come up. And, uh, and just one thing that I wanted to make sure was clear, because I did see the expressions of a lot of people. Um, people in St. Pete Beach or Tarpon Springs or Palm Harbor, because it is TIF, maybe a dime of their tax money might go to it. It's going to be a little bit because half of, you know, somewhat 40 to 50 percent of that is going to be county. Now, I personally, and the reason I'm bringing this up, I like that because, and I'm kind of on that belief, <coughs> if we send it to the county, we don't see it back. We rarely see it back. That's just the way it is between municipalities and the county. So if half of it is being paid for by the county, good for us. And uh, But we're going to make sure that you have all of the information you need. Uh, if it's in a workshop setting, that's fine, but I just don't want to, don't, we don't need to turn this into a, uh, a debate or anything like that. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go any further, I just did want to let folks know that we do have most of our budget department here, uh, and um, so uh, finance. As, as, yeah, yeah. But as, yeah. And so as soon as we finish this, we're 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 gonna we're gonna do uh, do the budget, finance, and tax, and the audit portion of the meeting. So just, if people would just be respectful of the fact that we've got about 20 people in the audience that are that are the staff folks waiting for the next item. Uh, Councilmember Newton. Thank you, Councilman. Council Chairs, took me 22 months and over 20,000 petitions signed by over 20,000 St. Petersburg voters to even get a second motion or have a discussion about this pair. 22 months. The mayor says we're depending on a lot of smart people, and we are. 160,000 registered voters. I said let the people vote. You know, I, it was a wise man once told me, he said, um, what I would have done is see, see, if it had been me, Newton, so I'd had a ballot. I had two questions on the ballot. One of them would have said, do you want to keep the pier and fix it up? Do you want to pare it down and do something different? And then I'd get that information and I would have went with it. That man was Mayor Baker. And I'm just shocked at Mr. Montemaro this morning because with your ideology, they would not have been halfway to the airport. 
That was the same gentleman that wanted to make Alpha Way part of the condos. And the people got the petitions. That gentleman, Mr. Baker, let them, and, and that council let them vote because that's the people that put them up here. And we saved Alfred with an airport. Now you roll around to the pier, the same process came up. You got, you said the cart before the horse. Well, you got um, my colleague saying, this would be like the green light Pinellas versus the lens. Well, at the end of the green light Pinellas, guess what? The people are going to get the vote. It's a major difference. They're not voting on this. You know, I just want the people to go out on August 27th and vote. Whether they get this petition done or not, you got a mayor and half of this council will, you got two vacant seats, but half of this council will be on the ballot. Please go vote. Don't worry about the shenanigans or all these technicalities because when I was running for office, never once did I tell you I would hide behind my lawyers or anybody else as it became your opportunity to participate in, uh, in this democratic process. You also have, we have a lawsuit that's filed, and the judge stated that, are we supposed to just not uh, recognize 20, only 20,000? Signed petitions or signed voters, their intent. That's what we're waiting here to come back. That's the judge. We also have another group that's, that's, that's eagerly getting their petitions up that will probably be and will be another petition. You know, this is more than the cop before the horse. This is a major train wreck. That's what this is. And you talk about leadership, you have got to let the people have a, a vote in this because if we go out there and start tearing up that, that ocean floor and have hundreds of millions in environmental mitigations, who's got to pay for it? You also um, talk about the, uh, the, the you were on the peer advisory committee. Well, they came back with a report that talked about things they want to see that done. And I, 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 I miss Mr. Wedding today. I do. I hope he's resting in peace. But... It was a lot of stuff went into that, and that got pushed to the side. You hear people saying things now like, it's in the spirit of the peer advisory report, you know? And knowing all we know now, this council, the majority of this council is saying that uh, we should continue spending money. I don't think we should. We also have, um, we also have um, the media, and I wish they would get this right. Everybody watching, everybody looking, please hear me, and please hear me well. Everything I've read said council supports this project. And I only beg that you would add one word for factual. The majority of council supports this project, not this whole council. Had it been the majority of council, we wouldn't be talking now. This would have been done. So all I'm saying is let the people vote. And, you know, to that avail, I would make a motion. I don't know where I'm going to go with this, but I'm going to do it anyway. That this council does not spend another dime until all of these petitions and that lawsuit runs its course in the spirit of being uh, uh, factual to the people that put us up here and being good leaders. Uh, Council Member Danner. <clears throat> if, I, if I could, Madam Chair, let the record reflect that I did make the motion and it died for like of a second because that wasn't said, please. Because I know you don't put that in a minute, but please put that in a minute. Thank you. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> um, aside from the report at the beginning of May, there are other reports scheduled and due as we go forward. Do we have a, a list? I know we don't have dates because they're not prepared, but there are going to be regular updates, regular opportunities to question the project as it goes from a concept to an actual design, correct? Yes, after the uh, detailed design phase may be approved by council, we're next scheduled to come back and report to you the results of that phase in the fall of this calendar year. Okay. And, I, and I also encourage the scrutiny and am not afraid of it, but I think we just have to follow the process. And we have these reports and scheduled events already in place. Um, even what Councilman Kennedy said, he likes the idea that it's the details on the engineering, but he wants to talk about the transportation, so that adds something to it. There's probably five other things we could do. I'm also concerned about that. I've had that conversation with Lisa Wanamaker about the trolleys, the sidewalks. Um, there's an example on Gulf Boulevard where it occurs, where cars, trolleys, bicycles, and pedestrians are on one horizontal surface separated only by paint. Um, not my favorite example, Gulf Boulevard's pretty busy place, um, but it is approved by DOT to do it that way. Um, but again, those are, are questions that, that 
need to be asked and answered. And I, and I think with, again, the, the opportunity to have these regular scheduled events, to keep moving forward with this project, to encourage the scrutiny of anyone and everyone that wants their questions answered, we should do it. But I don't want to be reactionary that any time someone has a question, we throw together a workshop and try to answer that question. Again, because I say we've already, in talking here, Councilman Kennedy wants to add an element to it. And if we want to add another one and another one, again, we have gone through a process. I think there is still a lot of unanswered questions. However, the mechanism is in place to get those answered. And absolutely nothing will be built that's not ADA compliant. And bridges will be approved by all the appropriate authorities. And I mean, you know, that's just that misinformation that really doesn't help. So, you know, again, I think knowing that there's a series of updates and reports that as this project develops and as anyone that has questions or concerns wants those answered, there will be a time and a place where they'll be answered as we move forward. Thank you. Council Member Dudley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to all this and in the meetings we've had, a couple of things come to mind. And I would like to personally set the record straight. First of all, I absolutely agree with what Mr. Montanari said. In real life, though, in the way this is kind of working out, I think by having a workshop, it will actually solidify our beliefs that we hold now. I voted for this thing all the way since its inception. And I think the one thing that they're holding a workshop, I'll get these things out in front, because the public still doesn't know a lot. And I don't mean that disrespectful, but, you know, there's still people who are asking what the lens is. You know, I was laughing today, Election Day, and the petition, they were having people sign the petition, and they did it okay. I'm not condemning that. They walk up, people coming out of the ballot, they said, would you like to sign a petition for what? The lens. What's the lens? And I'm sorry I couldn't help myself. I told them it was people against optometry. And they looked at me and, you know, there's still a lot of people who don't know what this all entails. And so I think by having the workshop, I think there are some questions that we can put out there, because I am sure that it will be covered. And there will be people there, press there, and people there. I respect Stop Lens Group. My God, half of you live in my neighborhood. And, you know, I really do, you know, I've known you guys for a while, and I, you know, I have a lot of respect for you. But there are other citizens in this community. And I think everybody needs to be told what's going on, and they need to have some factual information. Not that yours isn't. Technology changes all the time. And, you know, life is, you know, we have choices. And the fact that when you, as Mr. Dan said earlier, you know, what is it you don't, if we do all these things and get those questions all answered, will you support it? No, we just don't like it. Well, you know, likes and dislikes. You know, some people like a Ford, some like a Chevy. I mean, it's their choices for whatever your reasons are. But I would like to see us go ahead and do the workshop, get those questions answered. I have a couple just so we can, people can, when they try to ask that question, you say, no, no, here's the answer. This is what we've been told. We had citizen involvement and people who say, you know, I understand about, you know, petitions and all like that. And, again, I will, the question I told my good friends here on Stop the Lens is, where were you in 2008? You had 63, was it, opportunities, and where were you? And 
Um, so, and all this other stuff about, you know, environmental stuff and all like that, that's not for us to decide. We are, as the mayor said, we're not engineers. We, that's all part of permitting. It will have to be done through Corps of Engineers, and there's going to have to be somebody's going to have to write off on, on, um, on the buildings and, and all this stuff. So, um, that, that stuff, I don't worry about fire codes and all, because that's not in our purview. We don't take care of that. Transportation is something I think we need to look at. The material that we're talking about out there, whether it's aluminum and steel and the coatings and all that stuff, that's what we need to ask and get somebody, as somebody said, to sign off on it. Who's willing, if they're willing to do that and um, get those questions answered. And I think that's the benefit of the workshop. I think the workshop will actually improve our argument. And uh, so I'm absolutely in favor of it. Senator Curran. Thank you. But perhaps the time for workshop is after we get the uh, final schematic design to have that I just discussion. Said workshop. I, didn't say workshop. I think the thing, apparently, the workshop is supposed to be on technical concerns. Well, we have three different groups out there, and I think it's evidenced by this meeting right now and this discussion that this conversation is not going to be limited to that. I think we do a disservice to having a workshop at that date just on technical aspects that one group raises as opposed to we've got two other groups out there. We've got the uh, Stop the Lens, Save the Pier, and WOW. Who, who are, how are we going to do this in a fashion that we get answers just on those technical issues? Those will all come forward on May 2nd. The one thing, you know, and I've said before, I sit down with the Stop the Lens group or whoever else wants to discuss it at any time. The last question I asked them when we met the other day was, I was glad to see that they were so concerned about the taxpayer dollars going to it and the engineering Jump aspects. Them, Karen, that's your seven minutes. Well, that's too bad. Thank you for sharing that with me. But one thing I did ask you was, are you going to do this for Jump the police station? You're, you're next. So I'd like to see you form that group to have that workshop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, I just have a couple of technical questions. TIF funding, John? I want to. I, I have a question about TIF funding because I want to make sure my understanding of it is correct. Let's take the woman from St. Pete Beach. Does she? My understanding is that she would not pay taxes on that because even though the county does a portion, it's within that TIF district. So it would be our downtown residents and our. Is that is that correct or is that? Those taxes that the county are contributing mm -hmm. are from the increment of the downtown redevelopment area. In other words, the raise in value. Now, the argument on the other side is <clears throat> that okay. if we did not use that county money for anything in the downtown redevelopment area, right. it would go yeah, back into the, the county's general fund and could be spread out uniformly. So you can argue it either way. Right. Well, well, but, but the fact of the matter is... If we're going to use it in the downtown redevelopment area, which we have the county's permission to do. Uh, okay. It, it's really the taxes generated by the downtown area. Thank, thank you. And, and that, that was my understanding. So the, so the woman on St. Pete Beach, the, the people in Tarpon Springs, the people in my district, really their, their taxes that they pay to the county are not going into this. It's $50 million that's allocated just like every single project. Well, our attorney just said, said that. So um, if anybody wants to show me documents that prove it wrong, bring the documents. But, but I, I, you know, John hasn't, John gives typically good advice. And well, I, you know. And the other, the other point I want to make very quickly is this is the kind of thing that I don't want to have happen. When you have a group come in, uh, first of all, why do you pick one group over the other? And I think it should be based on professional, any group we bring in should be based on professional qualifications. And I just want to say that the whole idea that we're tearing up the ocean floor, Excuse I'm the chair of the Tampa Bay, let me finish this sentence, I'm the chair of the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, and the scientists that I interact with do not agree that we're tearing up the ocean floor. 
Thank we are you. not tearing up the ocean floor. That is just simply inaccurate. The final speaker is Councilmember Kennedy. If you'll make a motion at the end of this, so we can move on to this. Thank you. Um, first, I would request my colleagues to respect the chair and our timing. <laughs> Second, Mr. Connors. On May 2nd, are you going to be requesting us to appropriate money? Yeah. Yes. Yes. On uh, approximately how much money you're going to ask us to appropriate? I believe it's one, one point five million. Okay. That's why I think having the workshop before the May second meeting is a appropriate thing to do because we need to understand that before we do the appropriation. <laughs> With that, I would make a motion second. that we have the workshop on April eighteenth, uh, specifically limited to technical concerns and that when we do that, we respect our chair's opinion of keeping us limited to technical concerns. I also think it's important that the second portion um, with John Wolf explaining the different potentials with referendum is important. Uh, so second. Uh, with that, we I'll make a substitute motion that if we are going to do a workshop, that the people presenting at the workshop have appropriate professional credentials to do I would that. Accept that. Okay, so that is accepted. With that, we have a uh, roll call. I had a question on the motion. The second part, now we're adding referendum language to the workshop? I'm just looking at the new business item. And, <laughs> and why would we add referendum language? I'm, 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 I'm perfectly no, happy. Not referendum, just the, the technical issues relating to the possible referendum schedules, process, what the process would be. I've heard pause button. Okay, let's understand what the pause button really means. It means stop. No, pause. <laughs> pause is different than stop, really. Stutter. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Foster. I just want to make sure that we are that we on this side understand exactly what's being requested and and. I'm not sure we have clarity. Are you expecting a presentation from various pre-designated groups to present engineering questions? Like I said, I want to make sure this isn't a debate. And if we can, if we can know the questions before the second to make sure that we, again, satisfy you. Mr. Chair, we haven't, voted, voted, we haven't voted on this yet, so that even passed yet. So why are we? Figuring out what a workshop is going to be. So those that are, those that are, because again, we're going to request $1.2 million, and I want to make sure that we give you the information necessary to, uh, to based on information, vote one way or the other. So, again, is this going, are there going to be designated groups? Is it going to be a debate? Or is this going to be a presentation of, of engineers to answer your questions? My, my expectation with the motion I made is that basically, um, as, as set forth in the new business item by the chair, um, to have the concerns by April 11th so that staff is not short, you know, there's not a, there's not a gotcha question. Okay. Um, but the other thing I anticipate if somebody's going to say that aluminum and steel is going to fall away, I don't want that to be somebody who did an experiment in their garage. I want that to be somebody who, when the, the example of being an expert witness, I want a CV, I want somebody that's educated in the process. And quite frankly, I have the greatest respect to the opinion of what our staff is going to do. I agree with Coach that once this gets out, I think it's going to help the process go forward, but I want to be able to to hear an expert that tells me one thing, and if they disagree with our staff, I want our staff to be able to respond and say why they disagree with the expert. Okay. Roll call. What, could you read the motion, please? Um, <coughs> to move forward with the workshop on here on the 18th and to limit, it, limit discussion to technical concerns, that legal explain the referendum options, and that people who present at the workshop have a professional Okay. Excuse okay. me. Okay. So there, there were. So you just erased all the lights to discuss the motion that was made. Uh, 
You'd already had your seven minutes on this. I wasn't asking for myself. I saw the, that there was, was a light. No, there was a. That was the only other. That was the only light that had just come up. But but you've already done seven minutes. Roll call. <coughs> All right. No. Or now? No. Harris? Yes. Newton? Yes. Banner? No. Curtis? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Dudley? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, more on a uh, lighter subject, if uh, Council Member Kennedy would do the BFT report and the presentation that goes along with that. I will gladly do the BFT report. Um, before we get to the exciting program of the BFT report, <laughs> I think it's very disrespectful of people leaving before our, our audit is acknowledged. <laughs> but. The first, we had a BF&T report on March 28th, uh, 2013, and the uh, first matter we had was a uh, resolution of authorization uh, for a park relating to CDBG uh, funding. Joshua Johnson, the Director of Housing and Community Development, made a presentation to us, and in summary, this is relating to a, um, a park grant that's already been funded, and they're simply requesting changes uh, to the work description. A copy of that resolution is in with the material, and I would move approval of the resolution. Second. Second. Uh, with uh, roll call. Cornell? Yes. Nurse? Yes. Danner? Yes. Gordis? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. 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 Okay, then we had a uh, presentation from uh, staff as to the steps to keep the 2013 general fund budget in balance. Administration fo um, presented seven steps, which include departments asked to reduce the budgets by 1%, which will be especially challenging for fire and police. Uh, second would be quarterly expenditure monitoring. Third, the mayor's directive of delaying all discretionary expenditures. Uh, fourth, approvals to fill vacant positions um, are going to be scrutinized. Uh, reconsideration of all non-reimbursed activities that require overtime on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, sixth, refocusing time on service delivery and prioritizing any additional requirements. And seven, as to the 2014 budget, is developed any potential savings that do not impact services will be implemented there. We will have the second quarter report presented to BF&T on May 9th. Um, but then we get to the post audit uh, fiscal year 12, and may I ask our finance director Ann Fritz to come forward along with our uh, budget audit team, um, which includes uh, Laura Kruger Brock, Laura Tatum, and David Dedu. Um And this was an exceptional report. Um, before Ann gives the, the summary, I think it should be noted that um, this looks at all of the accounting, all of the funds moving in and out of the city. It included um, audits for eight major federal programs that were tested under a single audit. There was a comprehensive audit of all the grants. Uh, there were two major state programs that were tested, and basically we got a perfect audit. Um, that's something to be very proud of, and I therefore not only invited Ann and the audit team, but in every department that we have, we have people that report to finance that report to budget and keep those together. So we've asked them to join us today, too. And if I could ask you all to stand up um, to get recognized for things that you And Girls rule. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ann, but before we uh, complete this, I'm going to ask your indulgence for a big group photo up here of all the folks that did this great work. Ann? Ann? Yes. 
Thank you. As I presented at the BFNT meeting, um, our external audit for the fiscal year 2012 was uh, performed by our independent auditors of uh, Meyer Hoffman McCann, um, led by the audit team of Laura Brock. Laura is the partner, um, the partner on our engagement. And the, just to give you a little summary of the time that it takes, we actually start an audit in the summer before, during the fiscal year, where we actually have field work that's done out on the field starting like in July. We, our fiscal year ends September 30th, so there's quite a bit of work that's done between September 30th and I know you, we come to BF&T with budget cleanup items and full council with budget cleanup items and then the audit commences shortly thereafter and field work this year was completed at the end of January. Um, and we have issued the comprehensive annual financial report, which everybody has a copy of, and that was issued um, as of February 28th, 2013. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of the departments involved because it's not just the finance department involved in the audit, it is a citywide audit. So it's looking at all uh, areas of finance, including budgeting, um, internal audit assists with the audit, as well as ICS, our, our systems audit is pretty thorough that's done as well. Um, we also have uh, involvement with the um, all the regular departments, such as police, fire, all of their accounting staff has to be involved in the audit. Specifically, those who receive grant funding may have a, a, a much more thorough part of the audit that's required, you know, when their grants are selected as part of the testing. So I'm going to give the uh, opportunity for Laura Brock to kind of give you the summary of the audit results, uh, but I want to thank all the council for their support, and uh, we look forward to uh, continuing to provide a clean audit, a perfect audit to the city in years to come, although it is a very difficult task. So we cannot <laughs> promise that we can deliver the same thing next year because of the, the standard now. <laughs> Because of the because of the all the the work that it encompasses citywide, um, but Laura, thank you very much. Mayor, Chair, Council Members, thank you very much for having us today. Uh, my name is Laura Kruger Brock. I'm the partner on the uh, audit for this past year, for September 3012, and this was the second year uh, of us performing the audit. And as mentioned earlier, uh, as we discussed with the BFNT, uh, we were very. Uh, impressed with Anne and her team and department uh, this year. The prior year, we had a significant number of journal entries made as a part of the audit. We had several improvements that we had for recommendations, which included significant deficiencies and so forth. And as reported earlier, um, this audit was much smoother. We completed and issued the audit 30 days earlier than we had in the prior year. We had no audit adjustments at all as a part of the audit. And uh, Anne and her team has implemented all of the recommendations that we had had in the prior year. So I think that speaks volumes uh, for you and your staff and your team uh, to be able to give you reliable information that's credible, that you can make business decisions, uh, and that's very important to you. So I uh, did meet with the BF&T committee, uh, or, uh, on um, March 28th, and we spent a lot of time going through uh, the numbers and so forth. I'm not going to regurgitate all of that. I've provided a much condensed version of that, and I'll take very quickly a few minutes to go through that, uh, which you have in front of you at this point. The results of our audit was that we issued an independent auditor's report on the financial statements, which is an unqualified opinion. Can you put one of those on over here so they can sure. see the TDO in at home to see it? Sure, absolutely. You're giving all this praise that everybody I'm on page two. That the world see. Here we go. We issued an independent auditor's report on the financial statements, which is an unqualified opinion for the non accountants in the room. That's a clean opinion. That's the best opinion that you could receive on your financial audit. Because you receive uh, funds from state and federal, federal agencies, there are a couple other audit reports that we are required to issue. The next one is the independent auditor's report on internal control over financial reporting and compliance and other matters based on an audit of financial statements performed in accordance with government auditing standards. So not only do we have to audit your financial statements in accordance with the FASBs, the financial accounting standards, but we also have to audit those in accordance with the government auditing standards. And we issued our uh, independent auditor's report on that as well. Because of all of the uh, 
federal and, and state funds that you received. As mentioned earlier, we had a, a third opinion letter that we had to uh, provide, which was the independent auditor's report on compliance with requirements that could have a direct and material effect on each major program. We identified earlier, we tested eight major federal programs and two major state programs. And on internal control over compliance in accordance with OMB Circular A133 and Chapter 10.550 rules of the Auditor General of the State of Florida. Also included in your comprehensive annual financial report is a schedule of expenditures of federal awards and state financial assistance, schedule of findings and question costs if we did identify any uh, irregularities or things that we would have to report. And then finally, we have an independent auditor's management letter, which is required by the Florida Auditor General. Turning to the next page, I did want to point out that the, the city adopted several uh, GASB pronouncements this year, Government Auditing Standard Board pronouncements. Uh, that included GASB's number 60, 61, 62, 63, and 65. I know that doesn't mean a whole lot to you, but these are the standards that we have to comply with. Some of those standards had, had no applicability to you at all. Uh, some had no financial reporting impact. One did require reclassifications within the financial statements. And then finally, GASB statement number 65 required a restatement of some of those numbers. As noted in footnote 22 in the, in the CAF or the financial statements, this discloses the information regarding implementing GASB 65. And if you see on the, st the statement that you're looking at now, there's a little asterisk next to the 2011 numbers. And that's just informing you that those uh, have been restated uh, to comply with the restatements that were made. So the restatements just included uh, items that were previously reported as assets and liabilities under the new standard. They have to be reported as an expense as opposed to amortizing them. And also in the restatement, there was the treatment of the advances from the general fund to the grant fund and the airport fund. So looking at these numbers and the first two columns, uh, it's just the governmental activities. If you want to just look at the total revenues from the prior year and the current year, you can see that your total revenues uh, 2011 were 267 million and this past year 264 million. So that's a decrease of about 2.2 million, about a 1.9 percent decrease. And you can see where that's coming from. Primarily the decreases are in your operating grants and contributions, your capital grants contributions, and your property taxes. And then that coupled with the increases in your charges for services and your other category, which included earnings and uh, gains and, and losses and miscellaneous items. The middle two columns are your business type activities, and we can see overall that you had an increase in the general in the business type activities of about $4.3 million from $179.7 million to $184. Primarily that all came from your charges and services, which were the uh, utility rates increases that you had experienced. And then the far column uh, is the combination of those two, where you can see your total revenues increased about $2.1 million. Turning to the next page, this is the government-wide expenses, and again, focusing on the first two columns, which is the governmental activities, you can see your total expenses decreased uh, 13.9 million. So that's a big uh, decrease for you, about 4.8%, 4 and that is based on cost controls and operating efficiencies that the city had undertaken, and also just to remind you that there were some items in the 2011 audit that were some one-time expenses that you had incurred, which would include the workers' comp reserve funding, and in the community and economic development line item, you had a one-time uh, grant to the Dolly Museum. So coupled with that and the cost-cutting measures that you took, you uh, had a big decrease in expenses. The middle two columns, you were pretty uh, close on target with the prior year. So overall, total expenses decreased 483 million to 468, which is a 14.7 percent decrease. Turning to the next uh, slide, this summarizes your program revenues, your general revenues, and your total revenues, which was on the previous uh, slides, and also the program expenses, again, which is on the previous slides. So what you're looking at then is your increase, decrease before transfers, and you can see in the governmental activities that that was a negative 11 million as opposed to a negative 23 million a year ago. Looking at the business type activities, same thing, a much better improvement, an $8.5 million decrease as opposed to $13 million. Then you see the transfers between the uh, governmental activities and the business type activities, and you can see the changes in net assets. So overall, focusing on the governmental activities, the 2012 column, the change in net assets was a $3.7 or $3.8 million uh, decrease as opposed to $16 million the previous year. 
And then I've provided some percentages, which we talked about as well at the BFMT meeting, just what are the different percentages of revenues that are covering these expenses. And you can see the trends from the previous year, the current year, are, are pretty uh, comparable uh, from the prior years. Turning to page six, I had commented earlier that we had several uh, recommendations in the prior year. I uh, wanted to just speak briefly to those. They're broken down into different categories. A process improvement would be something that came to our attention that we just felt like you needed to improve, and those are reported in the uh, management letter that, that's required by the Auditor General. And a couple of those included last year, if, for those of you that uh, recall, where we had a recommendation on your procurement card testing, your information technology controls, and considering uh, getting into the 21st century with electronically uh, uh, documenting your permanent records, like uh, a lot of the permanent records that we looked at were ma manual copies, and we were recommending that you scan those and start getting those. Um, and you've implemented or are working towards all of those implementations. We did have a control deficiency, which is not a good um, thing to report last year, and that had to do with your account reconciliations. We felt like that you needed uh, improvement, reconciling capital assets, budgets. I mean, we, we encounter, encounter difficulties with several of the areas of the prior year audit, which <coughs> resulted in a significant amount of journal entries that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, Anne and her team has implemented a uh, process that, that we didn't have any of those issues this year, and all of those had been improved. And then finally, we also reported a significant deficiency, which again is, is a, a, is a I shouldn't say a worse item, but it's a little more of a significant, and that was your year-end closeout process. We had struggled last year with the books being properly closed out, all the adjustments being made, delays perhaps in the audit, and this year we didn't have any of those issues at all. Anne and her team had everything ready for us, all the schedules that we prepared. We gave her a fairly lengthy schedule of items that we need to perform our audit. And then, of course, during the audit when we pull samples and request invoices and so forth, we provide those to her and her team throughout the engagement, and those were all provided to us timely, and uh, we were able to complete the audit. So the current year, we did not have anything that came to our attention that we needed to um, discuss with you today or address. And that's it. I'd be glad to entertain questions. I know I answered a lot of those at BFNT, but um, thank you. Thank you, Laura. And if I may just ask Ann a question or two before we... Um, Ann, could you do me a favor and describe how all these people in here interact with the finance department and how that gets the capita to come together? Absolutely. We have quite an eclectic group. We have uh, payroll. We have accounts payable. Uh, we, and, and it's really interesting. Even on the payable side, you might not realize the amount of work that they have at year end, but part of the reconciliation process is to make sure <coughs> the invoice gets in the right year. So we had to really scrutinize and look at every single invoice and make a determination which fiscal year would that be appropriately recorded on. So these people here, even in payables, had to look at every single invoice and make that choice in order to make sure this is the, the clean cutoff that we needed. Um, payroll, payroll very involved in the process by making sure that not only our people get paid, but also have the reporting that's required for the audits. Um, budget is involved because part of the audit within our comprehensive annual financial report, we present budget versus actual um, reporting. So all of the reporting from the CAFR side has to agree to the budget side. So that's a very lengthy process, reconciliation process that we have to coordinate with budget. Uh, we also have grant managers. The grant managers are very involved in all aspects of the process to make sure that the grant not only are the expenditures appropriate, but also that all the compliance issues that are required with the grant um, and the re reporting that's uh, required with the grant, such as all the housing grants, um, they, they spend a substantial amount of time to make sure that the uh, monies are appropriately expended and, and appropriately accounted for um, for grant purposes. Internal audits involved in the process. Internal audit actually does a part of the audit for, on behalf of our external auditors. Um, we have a certain number of hours that they provide services and actually become part of the audit team. Um, the um, ICS is very involved in the process because all of our systems are electronic and all of our, our, our Oracle system is our enterprise system. And so ICS has to be heavily involved in the audit, not only from a reporting standpoint, but from a security standpoint. And part of the audit was a substantial looking at passwords, looking at controls. So they are very heavily involved in the audit as well. And the department personnel are, inv are involved 
from anything from billing and collections. Um, actually have to handle all the reconciliations on all the receivables. That is a heavy and a very significant part of our audit to make sure that we recognize the appropriate revenues in the, in the appropriate period. So kind of all of our external uh, accounting, finance, slash finance, and what times we call it budget, sometimes we call it finance, we know it gets confusing sometimes, um, but the accounting and financial reporting of the city is a pretty significant process, and it ent entails a lot of people, and we have a lot of professionals that really take their job very seriously and have provided years of service to the city, and we continue to improve every year, and this is why we're up here today that we, we believe that our, the staff here should be very well commended for the amount of work and effort that they do every day in order to make sure that the reports that go not only to council but externally to bondholders um, issuing statements are accurately presented and timely. So well thank you and thank you to all the staff that's been involved in this. Uh, congratulations and with that I would move to receive and file. Second. A couple of lights here first. Councilmember Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, and thank you very much, um, you and your leadership team. Um, and, and, and I just want to tell all of you, on, on behalf of every resident of District 1, thank you so much for what you do. Um, I, I, too, am a little disappointed that some people who were here earlier have left in the sense that some of them seem to think that there's a natural inference between being an employee of the city of St. Petersburg and some questionable competence. Uh, you are proof, living proof, uh, that that is not true. And I, I wish some of them would have stayed to recognize the accomplishments you've made, not just on this audit, but as Ann pointed out, every single day, things we don't hear about, things that nobody talks about. And what people don't seem to get is, you're taxpayers too. Why wouldn't you want to take ownership of good quality work? Why wouldn't you want to make sure that what you're doing every day is the best it can be? Uh, and, and I think it, I wish we could, uh, in, in an environment where some or all of you haven't had raises for years, yet you continue to take ownership of what you do, to want it to be the best that it can be, and to be proud of it. I'm proud of you. All of us are proud of you. A tremendous, tremendous job. Um, and, and I know, I, I, you know, I, I hesitate to say this. I know you won't rest on your laurels. I'll know you're come to work tomorrow and the next day and the next day uh, doing the same great work. Uh, you know, the other thing that people need to realize, and this isn't a derogatory remark, this is a compliment. Auditors are paid to find problems. That's what, the, not, not problems. <laughs> Auditors are paid to find opportunities for improvement and to make recommendations as to how things can be better. And, and you have an unqualified audit with no comments. That's just incredible. And these people are top-notch auditors. I mean, I know Laura for a long time. I don't know the other Laura and David as well, but I can tell you they wouldn't be working with Laura Kruger Brock if they weren't top notch. I know that. <laughs> so, so it's just incredible what you've done. And we can't say thank you enough. Uh, I mean, it just doesn't do anything. Know that all of us are trying to find some way to get you some compensation recognition. You and your colleagues across the city, please know that. We're, try we're working hard to try and do that. And lastly, I'll just say, if because the peer debate went so long and you got here early and you got a parking ticket, <laughs> you bring it to me, okay? Don't tell your supervisor, just bring it to me and I'll get it paid. Thank you. Okay, Councilman Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Laura. And I, I want to uh, echo that. I know it's been for almost five long years before you got to dine. Some of you participated in the, in the rollback with, the, with, with Mayor Baker. I mean, since I got here, they advertised 47,000. I haven't seen it yet. But they always say, rolling back and council. And I do hope that some of you are still here when they're asking for each department to make even more cuts, when they're already cutting into the bone marrow, beyond the bone. So 
it is appreciated. Laura, you said something on, on page four up on the city of St. <coughs> St. Petersburg, government wide expenses. You, you were going kind of quick, I know, to get through it. I'm but sorry. you mentioned something about it. We had a, um, a grant to the Dali. Was that the two and a half million dollar tip, or is that something different? Uh, in the prior year, 2011, you had a uh, grant to the Dali Museum. I don't remember what the. Was that the two and a half million dollar tip, or? It was the two and a half million dollar tip. grant that we did through the through the TIF, yep. so it would be appropriately categorized with community. So I'm trying to figure out. We we gave them two and a half million from the TIF. Is that additional? In addition to that two and a half million? No, no. It's the same. No. The same money. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just trying to keep track. We gave them that. Plus we had um hundred some thousand impact fees. We, we 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 held back. So I'm just trying to keep track. I know you said that, and I want to yeah. make sure that was the same money. It wasn't additional money right. for the people listening. Right. So I appreciate it, and thank you for all you sure. do. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cornell. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, uh, Ms. Brock and your team, and Ms. Fritz and your team, and the whole staff here. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. And, and you know, uh, you do such a great job, actually. Maybe I was wrong. If you all have any opinion about aluminum siding and you want to come to the workshop, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should invite you. <laughs> no, but I, I really um, deeply appreciate you. You know, I worked for the city for 20 years before I uh, went to the school system. And so I get what you're going through, and um, it, it really, um, it really does fire me up a little bit when people just make blanket criticisms of government employees and excessive, you know, benefits and and lazy employees and things like that. Because you all are an example of what's really great about our city, and I really, really appreciate what you do. And and um, I just want you to know that I, I, I truly do, and. I know the budgets have been rough the last few years, and um, you know hopefully it's getting better, and hopefully we'll be able to take care of that in, in the near future. Um, but I really do appreciate you, and um, you've done an excellent, excellent job, and our whole city, our whole, our, all our citizens appreciate it as well. Just want you to know that. Thank you, Councilmember Kern, and then the mayor. Thank you. I'll just say this real quickly so I don't run out of time. I just want to thank all of you, especially <laughs> Anne. Laura, your team, fabulous work, and everyone that's here this morning. I think when you see you all lined up, sometimes you forget how many people it takes to do the job that you do. And uh, we really thank you for all of your work, and Councilmember Gerda said it well. So thank you. Thank you. Mayor Foster. Well, one of the things I learned early on as, as mayor is that you can't, you can't know everything. You can't be an expert in everything. Don't even try. But surround yourself with experts, surround yourself with uh, high quality uh, people who are educated and trained and, and uh, that's what we've done. Now I, to, to see finance lined up like this, one of the, uh, another thing that I, I learned uh, early on from my wife was who handed me a debit card and said this is all you're ever going to see. Um, so she she does, you know, all of my billing and collections, personal finance, budget, payroll. Um, she does all of that because I understand. But she's helped me understand my <laughs> limitations <fine>. as well. <laughs> and and so we have created a finance department just like just like home, um, surrounded by women. I don't know how to. I don't know if I should have empathy or uh, envy of Tom, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, this this department, through Ann and Tom's leadership, uh, is incredible. And uh, the audit was great. Laura, thank you for uh, your presentation. Thank you for uh, just making sure this external audit is uh, is a very useful tool. It's it's not only to make sure that we we are doing things right, but it kind of it gives us an indication of of where we need to go. And if there are Comments or deficiencies. It gives us that ability uh, to make pre, you know, mid-year corrections and things like that. So, uh, thank you for that. But Ann and Tom and, and to all of you here, uh, thank you for your dedication, your passion in serving uh, not only all of the other departments, which can be a pain, uh, but all of the citizens of St. Petersburg and, and the taxpayers. Your uh, your your skill is is recognized and uh, greatly appreciated. So, thank you. Thank you. Did you get a perfect audit? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and um, 
I guess before we do the photo, maybe uh, Coach had a good idea of maybe having everybody just introduce themselves by name and what department they're from. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on, Coach, come on, come up to the microphone. I think we'll start with Erica. Hi, I'm Erica Jennison. I'm Financial Reporting Coordinator under Tom and Ann in the Finance Department. Hi, I'm Dave Stewart. I'm Finance System Coordinator under uh, Ann and Tom in the Finance Department. <laughs> Hi, I'm Wayne Finley. I manage the Grants Administration Program. Uh, she's also a high school boys basketball referee. <laughs> so she, uh, when she wears her stripes to work, <laughs> she's not fooling around. <laughs> Back here too. <laughs> <laughs> I they were Good morning. I'm Tom Green. I'm the new budget director and had absolutely nothing to do but came to support Ann. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? That's it. Okay. All right. That's why we're doing it. a question for <laughs> oh, oh, um, Council Chair Kennedy. Um, I was looking here. When the council committee report, it says a resolution. Uh, you didn't say anything about resolution. Are we approving resolution? Yeah, we did. We voted on it. Okay. Okay. Then you say remote receiving file. I thought maybe that was. No, but uh, the first yeah, we did that very that the very first thing. I went, okay. to, I went to the Tommy John's. Okay. With that, we have a we have a motion and a second yes. to receive a file. Yes, we do. Roll call. Carmen. Yes. For now. Yes. Nurse. Yes. Newton. Yes. Henry. Yes. Curtis. Yes. Kennedy. Yes. Kennedy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. Picture. And uh, they, they wanted to have yeah, folks come up and we'll do a pitch, picture. We have Tom Lee. Let's see what we're doing. Come on. Don't be shy now. Let me go find her, make sure. Gotta go all the way across. Yeah, all the way across. Some on the other side, too. Well, his name is McDaniel. That's my way. Congratulations, and thank you. I think we're going to have to do a double challenge. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the, the front row is just... Yeah, great. Uh, okay, yeah. I want to... I want the payroll people stand so in front. So you can get a little closer, okay? It's all... It's a teamwork exercise. Who's the payroll people? Those are the people you <laughs> tell you up to. Coach wants to check. Actually, I'm calling them. Yeah, put the tall people in the front. They got just enough short people. Look at that. <laughs> Regular size. Vertically challenged uh, <laughs> individuals. Maybe on the end, Yeah, just 
Exactly. Right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Not> a girl. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's what we call it. You call it help we have another name. I'm going as fast Thank you for keeping Thank the name out of love and <laughs> Now that'll be your Christmas card, so we'll get the picture to you. Thanks for keeping the mayor out of love and work. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to try to wrap the rest of this stuff up if we can, and, 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 and that way we can do it with everything. Okay. Hey, you did the um, okay, great. Did uh, part thing? Yeah. Councilmember Dudley, are you ready for a public services and infrastructure report? Can we do it now? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, let me find my little oh, sheet here. There. Okay. The Public Service Infrastructure Committee met on March 28th. Um, we were discussing the Pinellas Park termination agreement. Um, Steve Levitt from our water department came and... Um, gave us a presentation. This is the uh, report on the agreement that has been in place since March 12, 1987. Uh, Mr. Levitt noted that the termination agreement would reduce some revenues as well as some expenses. Um, he also noted the loss of revenue would be minuscule. Mr. Levitt informed the group that the termination agreement will go before City Council for consideration prior to December 31st, 2013, uh, disconnection. Um, that was the bulk of the business. The rest of the uh, committee time was taken uh, about um, pending referrals. Oh, I, let me go back. And um, the, the agreement, um, the termination of the agreement um, was part of the development of the gateway area and consolidating uh, approval process. Uh, that area in question is um, how did um, in the gateway in that um, commercial area and Pinellas Park uh, uh, looking to you know, further develop all that. Um, it was suggested um, that report be, sent, be presented regarding the loss of revenue versus loss of expenses and Councilmember Nurse made a motion to send this to council, which we're doing today. And uh, before we go on, let me go ahead and uh, we have a the uh, resolution. Let me see where is it here. Second. Um, need to get that approved. We can have. Everybody should have it in the packet. So moved. Second. Roll call. Karen. Yes. Cornell. Yes. Nurse. Yes. 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 Banner? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Yes. In the last part of the meeting, um, we just talked about the referrals and um, uh, trying to get them a little prioritized and get them on the schedule to move them along. Our next meeting will be April 11th, and uh, we're going to have the pie sharing. Uh, Mr. Joe Kubicki will be in charge of that. I request that we receive the file. Second. Roll call. Karen? Yes. 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 First, we got an update on the Jamestown Apartments and the Dwight uh, Gooden Center, or the Dwight, excuse me, Dwight Jones Center. The Dwight Jones Center has been completely renovated, uh, which, which did include uh, new air conditioning, which it desperately needed. Uh, Jamestown Apartments, uh, they, we, had, we saw the pictures of the work being done. There are quite a number of apartments that are literally being gutted. 
and those are being uh, those are being renovated as as we speak. Um, in addition, uh, a good number of apartments got. Uh, uh, <coughs> A new air conditioning system by way of weatherization in the Urban League, and then about 85 toilets have been replaced through another fund. Uh, we are still looking for uh, for the final money, but the second, the next wave is out for bid right now. So there's another roughly nine, nine or ten more apartments that will that will get renovated in the next wave. We got an update on the foreclosure registry, uh, which is uh, is being ramped up. When, when last week they had been up for about a week and they had 400 units uh, that had been registered so far. We think there might be as many as 4,000 uh, at, at this point. So Mr. Bush will come back to us on, the, on that after, uh, after it's fully operational. Next we got an update on the uh, neighborhood stabilization program. Um, we have, currently we have uh, four uh, NSP, uh, four houses that are available for sale, for, for sale, three of them are under contract. We, ha we have five houses in the NSP3 area, which for in, to, in, in English for the, for the public is the area that is the most challenged in the city as measured by foreclosures of property drop, crime, that kind of thing. Uh, we have, and so we've got five units under construction in, in those neighborhoods now. And they're, they went out for bid uh, earlier this week for, for five more. And so we are making some progress on that. Uh, the, uh, the next thing we really talked about was the uh, foreclosure settlement and the, and the, uh, the state money. As, as you uh, probably know, the uh, state of Florida got $334 million as part of the foreclosure settlement. The, uh, the uh, the Attorney General uh, uh, has had an agreement with the uh, President, the Senate, and Speaker of the House that, that a significant portion of that would, would, would come to local governments for the, for the purpose of mitigating the impact of foreclosures, which is, of course, what the lawsuit was about. There's a struggle going on right now um, as to whether or not that will happen or not. I mean, the money, the money, the money has come to the state, but it, uh, the House has not been favorably disposed towards, towards sending us any of that money to mitigate the settlement. And the second piece of that is what's called SHIP funding, which is a tax on uh, every time you buy a piece of property, there's a tax that goes into a fund for affordable housing. It's been, it's been in place for about uh, 20 years. The last four years, all of those funds have been diverted to uh, uh, balance the budget. This year, now that there's, there's money again, uh, we're trying to, to, to uh, make sure that we get some of that money. Uh, we do have a motion in, in support of, of using the SHIP funds, or we have a, we have a resolution here that we'll need a motion uh, you know, to the legislature uh, in, in support of using the SHIP funds for what they were intended, which was affordable housing. Move approval. Second. Before we go any farther, I know the mayor has been in Tallahassee the last three days, and this is one of the things he was working on. Perhaps you could enlighten us a bit. Well, I had a good meeting with um, Speaker of the House, Will Weatherford, and, um, and senators on the other side, encouraging them to really, especially on the House side, to look at the Senate's proposal. The Senate's proposal puts $70 million into SHIP. Um, the, the House proposal has it broken into so many little different Piles, whether it's uh, uh, legal administration to, uh, they had an allocation for uh, domestic violence and uh, things that were, arg could arguably be related to foreclosure, but not really treating the victims of the actual people losing their homes. Um, the Senate proposal, 70 million ship, uh, 50 million sale, which is uh, affordable housing over 55 seniors, multifamily. Uh, and some others, it's really more favorable. Uh, I was asking for a, a, a separate pot of money to do blight removal, uh, not associated with SHIP. And um, so made a lot of headway. And, uh, and speaking with House members, encouraging them to at least, at minimum, adopt the Senate proposal, uh, working at other ways that, that 
that we're city could, could even match if it's uh, blight removal. And like I said, we have some funds for blight removal. If I could double that um, using these funds, we, we certainly would be amenable. So uh, made some headway. And um, I think they, they get that this was a foreclosure settlement due to improper, the, the improper conduct of banks. And the victims of that were uh, people who lost their homes and lost their credit and have a, the, almost the inability to, to go back in homes. So um, again, the House kind of went off in a di different direction. But in speaking with the Speaker, I think we have a great opportunity to, to kind of bridge that. So I feel comfortable that, that, that we'll get it back on track. And even the House members that I spoke to like the Senate's proposal. So um, we'll continue to advocate <laughs> and monitor that. And, and if, uh, if the team has to go back up to, uh, to do a little more, we will. <laughs> it was a successful uh, day at the, at the State Capitol. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. House Member Newton. Thank you, sir. I um, also enjoyed that report on Jamestown. I think it's a huge, huge uh, um, improvement over what was going on there. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we are sh getting some of the savings from installing those new HVAC systems. <clears throat> from what was reported, um, the, the light bill is now half of what it was costing to operate that place over there. Um, all, um, and also with the Florida being now the number one state as it pertains to foreclosure, and a lot of people, well, a lot of the investors coming to this area buying up property because the new norm is going to be rentals. I would, um, and also knowing that we only need, we only got 38 units left to uh, have that place 100% and online and also generating positive revenue, I would make a, a motion that we use the, uh, I think they said it's about $2 million that we try to do, do we do a $2 million loan from our reserves to be paid back from the Jamestown uh, Enterprise Fund and also to generate more revenue to give us more rental capacity if we could instead of piecing them like the way we're doing. There, let's see, there is a motion on the floor already, right? Yes. yes. So there, there the well, I can wait to do that. I'm, I have my life wish before we got to that, but I'll wait till, I can wait after that. All right. Either. Is that the proper procedure legal? There's one already on the floor. Motion. You should be discussing what's on the floor. Right. right. Okay. Okay. Are either of the lights on the, uh, on the ship related resolution? No, I just have a quick comment. No, not on that. On the overall topic, though. So I'll come back oh, if you okay. want me to turn the light back on. Well, well, no, just just one second. Council Member Purnell, or, uh, I mean, Curran, are you are you in the ship thing? Um, no, I'm actually going to speak to Council Member Newton's mm -hmm. comment. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. If if we may, let's go ahead and do roll call on, on on the motion on the floor, and then we'll come back to the rest. And of that's approval of the ship. Yes. Curran. Yes. Purnell. Yes. Nurse. Yes. Newton. Yes. Banner? Yes. Curtis? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Okay. I just, I just wanted to say I'm really happy that this week we seem to have made major progress on realizing that there was actually a settlement and that those banks did pay it. So I'm real happy about that. But I hope if we get some money that we work towards certainly uh, some of the remedial things that we do, but I think a portion of that money needs to go into prevention because we have a list. We have over... Um, about 4,000 homes in foreclosure, 600 of which are with Bank of America. And if we can prevent people from going out of their homes in the first place, that makes, I, I think that's probably less expensive and more efficient in getting the problem solved. So I hope we um, do get some of the money and I hope we look at prevention, foreclosure prevention um, as part of that. Um, I will request that we get at uh, the next housing committee meeting um, the folks who are doing foreclosure prevention counseling there to give us an update as to where they are. I, you know, uh, that's a complicated process, and I, I wouldn't, I don't, only the people who work in it every day really know what's going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilmember Curran. Well, I was waiting for Councilmember Newton. Councilmember go back. Yeah. Well, I, as I said, we're, we're, we're close. We got 38 uh, units left, <coughs> that, and this is from Raul Cantana that we have an estimate approximately. $2 million need to finish up Georgetown to be done with it and get those rental units online. So I would make a motion that we uh, do a loan from our reserves to the, the, the Jamestown um, Enterprise Fund to be repaid back and also have all those units generating revenue for the city. 
be my motion. Second. There's no dollar figure on the loan, I think. The uh, he said an estimate, Raul estimated about two million for 38 units. And what I'm looking to do is if we can get that wrapped up, we can probably get all those rented out and get some revenue coming in. The, the first revenue is to pay back the loan option like we did with the, uh, with the, with the golf courses and that, that borrow from the, the uh, reserve and pay it back also. Councilmember Curran. Thank you. Um, no, I just second it for discussion. I don't know whether that's the appropriate um, way to get the funds. I think we had discussed that before, but I do agree that we, we should finish those units and start getting that income. Um, we're, we've done a great job on the ones that are finished. We need to just get them done. We need to finish Unity Park and get all the transits out of there so the families and kids can finally use it again. So whatever, I'm, I'm not sure if you're, if you want your motion just to state that specific um, allocation from a, a loan or if there is another way, and Mayor, maybe you can address this, we've talked about it before, to just get the funds to get that finished. Let, let, let me go to the Mayor next, if I may. Well, and I'll, Ann's not here, but you know, we, we did task staff to look at uh, ways that we could borrow the money to, to just complete that. The trouble has been we will not receive, even in spite of market rent, we will not receive enough income to repay the indebtedness, on the, the debt service on anything that we borrow. So um, if we borrow, we'll repay the debt service out of General, the general fund or any other sources we can come up with, um, but that's been the issue. The, the rent will not cover the debt service, and, even, and, that's, and that's anticipated. And I, did I overspeak? Or? No, that's correct. So we can borrow it, but we'll have to repay it out of the general fund or other income sources, but it will not come from the rent, uh, even, even from the newness of the facilities. So that's that's kind of the dilemma. Councilmember Newton. Yeah, I'm wondering how does it work when we loan money to the golf course to, 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 uh, to borrow stuff from the general fund? I've seen them do it, and then they get they make their purchase to do what they're going to do, and they pay them back. How does that work? Green fees, fees, green fees, uh, buckets of balls. I know, but who pays the debt service on that on that loan? The enterprise. Right. Well, that's what I'm that's what I'm getting at. Um, we would have we we have currently. I think they showed us an estimate of revenue. And it's trending positive, but at nine uh, units, uh, I don't know, a year? Well, it's been six months, almost a year, and we got 38 left. It's going to take a long time to get But it's not like those 38 are unoccupied. I mean, the occupancy rate is actually pretty good. So, But even as you project out occupancy, um, it's still not going to generate sufficient rents to pay off the debt service. So, yeah, would, green, green fees and buckets of balls and all of that, it, it generates sufficient income, A, to maintain the golf course, and B, to repay the debt service. Let me, let me this, this, is, this would not. Let me suggest something, if I, if I may. Let me suggest that perhaps what would be logical would be to come to Housing Services. It's about, it's about four weeks from now, so you have some time with some choices as to you know, what could we do and where, where might be, we be able to get money. And, and, you know, it may be that you decide, well, there's only this, this, we can only do this much because we, we have to take it from this and pay it back. Or, well, let's, okay. does, does, that, does that work? That'll work. Uh, Mr. Chair, I know you went through an exercise, or, or BF&T went through an exercise where there was asked the staff that they loan from all of the funds that we have. And I think it was no, 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 and H no <laughs> on a couple of them. Well, but all, all I'm trying to get at is we need to find ways to generate revenue. We have units that we can do that with. And I know right now we're getting 100% of nothing. Well, no, I, the ones I, that I, I understand. That's, that's I mean, the rationale. And, 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 and they're making great steps, but I mean, great steps, but at nine at a time, and you got 38 I, I left. I completely agree. And, and the, the mayor did say they'd come to us and, you know, in, in about well, that's, a that's, that's acceptable. Okay. Councilmember Gertz? Well, what's the motion, or is are you withdrawing the motion? Well, uh, um, the mayor, at least I, even him and our CMS, they have challenges right now doing it the way I'm suggesting. 
but they will bring, I guess, some some options or to the uh, housing committee. And, uh, and if the second is a meeting over there. I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. I was also I parked over there um, opening day, right at right at Jamestown. I, I, I thought I was on the. I, I asked a question, I, and now what? No, no. What I, what I was okay. Let me rephrase it. What I was doing. Um, what you The chairs asked the mayor and and Tish could they find a way to, to maybe do it another way to get that completed. Yeah. So the, the two, I, I was saying do two million out of reserves. So I'm saying that's a meaning more to me, and so a meaning more to the second. I'll pull that back and just get them time to come back to us so we can do this and we can do that. Okay, thank okay. you. Councilmember Curtis. I, I thank you. I'm good. Uh, Councilmember Cornell. Yeah, I would just like to get a copy of the analysis that showed that you <laughs> understand it better. Yep. We'll bring it to the Housing Committee. And to okay. make sure oh, council have all of it. Okay, okay that's uh, fine. Or, or if you just have a memo or something or a, some written documents that you want to send me, that would be fine, too. Okay. It doesn't have to be a full. Okay. With that, we, I could use a motion to receive a file. So moved. Second. Roll call. Yes. Cornell. Yes. Nurse. Yes. Yes. Newton. Yes. Banner. Yes. Curtis. Yes. Kennedy. Yes. Yes. Let me go back, if I may, to the... Uh, to the last new business item, which is from Councilmember Curtis on uh, yellow light time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what I'm asking for is uh, the Council's approval of a re referral to uh, PSNI that would uh, require staff to make a report to, to PSNI about the feasibility, number one, and the consequences and or impacts, number two, of increasing yellow light interval times at red light camera intersections only. Um, and that's, that's what I'm specifically asking you to vote up or down. The reason I'm bringing this forward, um, I, was, I was not on council when red light cameras were approved but it happened during the campaign time that I was running for office. I publicly supported red light cameras. Uh, I did research. I met with people um, at the time and still today. Uh, my conclusion, at least from the research, and my CV doesn't have any engineering uh, background <laughs> on it. But, but from reading what I've read, there seems to me to be um, a kind of split between the body of data that's been generated about whether red light cameras are effective or not. There's, there's some data that says they are, some data that says they're not. But there's also a body of data about increasing yellow light interval times. That body of data, I use the word unanimous, uh, if it's not unanimous, it's very, very one-sided data that says if you increase yellow light intervals, you will decrease red light running and you will decrease crashes. Now, the one critique of that body of data is, yes, there's a decrease in red light running and yes, there's a decrease in crashes, but it's a short-term increase or improvement only and over time drivers adjust to the changed interval and you will return to the percentages and numbers of incidences that you were at before you changed them. That's true. Um, there's some evidence that says that critique is in a case-by-case -case setting not not true. For instance, there's some data from some towns in California where there's actually a three-year, not just improvement, but a continued improvement over a three-year period. And the state of Georgia thought that it was so productive, they actually passed a state statute that said if you use red light cameras, you have to increase yellow light intervals. So what I'm, what I'm presenting to you is an argument that says there's a, a strong, strong body of evidence that increasing yellow light intervals decreases red light running, decreases crashes, and even if, even if it's short term or short lived, to me, if it's about safety, which it is, you would accept even a short term improvement in safety, a short term improvement in decreasing crashes, 
because that's really what we're after. So even if it's short term, I think we should go after it and capture it. But what I'm, what I'm asking is that staff do a report to PSNI about that data so it can be presented to all of us, we can question it and decide where to go from there, whether to do it or not to do it or whether to pursue it any further. That's, that's a motion. So, I, yeah, I, I would move to approve. Second. And administration's okay with that? We'll be prepared with the information and answer all of your questions. Thank you. Uh, House Member Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I want, if John, if you would, would you give us the, the, the power that the council has as it pertains to this red light camera program and, and red light cameras and to do with lights and where they put the cameras and all that? If you would, sir. Again, your power with respect to the red light camera program is to kill it completely. That's all we have. Now, the other is operational, and you can make recommendations to the mayor with respect to uh, the subject that uh, Council Member Gertis brought up. Uh, there are limitations, I understand, by the state as to what what that entails, but that can all come out at the committee meeting. But uh, your power to over operational things such as this are limited to recommendations right. to the mayor. Your Policy po recommendation. Right. Your power on the red light camera program right now is to kill the program. Um, well, I respect my colleagues' uh, uh, position on extending yellow light times. During the hearing before we adopted the red light camera program, I had staff uh, they ensured me that they could, so they could do all yellow at intersections from our computer system to make them all yellow. So if anyone would run a light and have a crash, it would be two people running red lights simultaneously. Uh, that would make every one of them safe without a camera, and that was not a good idea. Also, we have two-thirds of the, the tickets issued at these red light camera sites are for turns, two-thirds. And turns represent point zero, I think six, I'm not sure, probably close, of the accidents at these intersections. So uh, there's nothing to do that's, that's going to help the people there. Also, we have the, the, the clerk of the courts asking uh, that the city to stand down and, and the administration who has power over this program, not council, has the power to do that. And instead, they opt to do something else. So we are limited to what we can do. Um, it's a great idea. I say, however, it's, um, it's picking because you can't do it on state roads. Am I correct? You can't control state roads with yellow light intervals. There are lights. Defer to Mr. Kabik. Am, am I correct, Joe? Can, you, can we change uh, intervals on state roads, yellow light intervals? Florida Department of Transportation maintains responsibility over that, so they're, they're the ones that make that decision. Approximately how many cameras we have on state roads? Do you know that? Uh, are all of them? Almost all of them. Almost all of them. Yeah. As Council sees, here again, we have no power on, on this program. The workshop, if we did it and referred to PSNI, would be ceremonial at best. The only person that can do anything about this camera program is the current uh, the leadership. And for that reason, I would make a motion that we kill this program. Second. That's a substitute. That's a substitute motion. Oh, a substitute motion. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Council Member Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I was actually going to speak on the first motion. Since we have a substitute motion, um, I have a uh, feeling of deja vu one more time um, and would oppose the substitute, substitute motion for all the reasons expressed last time. Uh, then the time before that and possibly the time before that. But since we do have uh, TV cameras here, they should consider looking at green light Pinellas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Danner? Uh, no, not on the motion. I'll vote the same way I have the last ten times as well. So, okay. Councilmember Curtis. The clerk did not ask us to stand down. The clerk asked us to stop issuing certain citations. Increase in yellow light intervals will decrease citation issuances. It's totally consistent with what the clerk's looking for. Uh, so. And, and, you know, as far as the DOT control over lights, um, they're, they're, they're our lights. We program them. I'm sure this is a policy recommendation only. We can make a policy recommendation to DOT. And I don't think it's ceremonial 
for this body to consider taking an action that would decrease crashes and decrease citations even in the short term? Call the question. Second. All those in favor, call on the question. I'm sorry, I apologize. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's not ca this is calling the question. This is a question. Yes. For now? Yes. Nurse? Yes. Newton? Yes. Danner? Yes. Curtis? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. 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 Question on the floor now is to terminate the red light camera contract, or mm -hmm. as Council Member Newton put it, to kill the, right. kill the red light program. Right. Yes. Program. Cornell? Yes. Nurse? No. Newton? Yes. Danner? No. Curtis? No. Kennedy? No. Oh. Okay, the original motion is now on the floor. Okay. That, 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 that motion failed, right? That motion yeah. failed. Okay. Okay. The motion on the floor is for the workshop or the referral to the committee. Okay. Help me one second here. A whole bunch of lights just came on. <laughs> if we have called the question, was that on? That was just on the. Okay. Yeah. Call, call this question. Call the question. The, the, on the uh, yellow light referral. On, on the referral. It's just a referral the referral. to committee. The workshop yeah. shouldn't happen up here. We it could happen in we'll community. Be <laughs> we'll, we'll be there. Okay. Has there been a motion to call a question? A roll call? All right. Yes. Cornell? Yes. Nurse? Yes. Newton? No. Banner? No. Curtis? Yes. Kennedy? No. Dudley? Yes. What was about? That passed, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Now then, Five we have. Yep. Two thirds. Two thirds of okay. six. So that so that <laughs> failed. Yeah, okay, you didn't make two thirds. So call the motion okay. failed. Okay. We have some <laughs> lights then. Councilmember didn't. Um, uh, I. I, I agree and respect my, my colleagues' uh, voting, I mean, the way they vote. But if you truly want to help the people, you have the power to do just that. And the only power we have, legal has told us time and time again, I keep making the motion, they keep doing it the same way. To me, anything else other than that for the, for the people in this city is pandering. It's all it is. I mean, you could, we, we have the power to, to fix this. All the, what's wrong with it legislatively, uh, for people to have a due process, uh, increase in accidents, and for a whole host of reasons. So, you know, I, um, I am on PS and I, but I will not support or participate in a process that's going to be just pandering for, for the voters. I'm gonna, I want to do something subsidy that will help them, like killing this program. Councilmember Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know, people I speak to support the program. Um, Joe, um, have you considered red light, uh, yellow light interval? <coughs> in the establishment of the program that we have now? Certainly, we've discussed it on many occasions as to what the yellow light interval is on our signals. So we have discussed it, yes. And we have considered it, yes. And you believe that what you're doing now is appropriate? <clears throat> we believe what we're doing now is appropriate, but we're not objecting to the fact of taking a second look at it. So. Uh, we as staff uh, always feel it looking over our shoulder and maybe we'll bring in some experts from the outside that deal with yellow timing uh, and have them look at what we've done to reinforce the fact that we're doing it correctly. Thank you. Council Member Danner. Um, now that answers my question. I, I think Joe's reported numerous times that all of our signals are within the DOT standards for the red light phase, for the green light phase, for the yellow light phase, for the length of the intersections. And I guess we'll just talk about this every week until forever, but um, you want to have another workshop? We'll have another workshop, but he has reported numerous times that all of our signals fall within the guidelines and the criteria set up by DOT. Okay. That's my regrets. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to take up the council's time with stuff that's already been discussed. In my year and three months here, we have not talked about yellow lights. Other than to say that the yellow lights all meet the minimum standard. The, the state statute is a minimum. 
And the fact of the matter is, the 22 intersections that we have cameras at, some of them are more than the minimum, and some of them are right at the minimum. So we already have a mix. And that may indicate that the analysis they've done said these 12 intersections need to be different because this, 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 and this. All I'm asking is that we, we, look, we look at just the subject of yellow lights at just those intersections. The answer may be it is what it is, but I, I, we, I haven't been here when we've had a discussion about that subject, the data behind it, and other than that it meets the minimum state statute. So that's, that's why I'm asking for this. Just to remind folks, this is just a referral. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was the workshop. Council Member Curra. Well, it is a referral, but it doesn't have to be referred if we decide not to do it. So it is the first time, though, however, that I've heard Joe stand up here and actually say that you'd welcome the discussion when even though you uh, – went by the guidelines, the state standards, on and on and on for all the intersections and everything. There was a little hesitancy there, in my opinion, about your take on the yellow light. So if we need to have a discussion about it, so be it. I still vote and will continue to vote to get rid of the program, period. But if there's something we need to do, then we need to look at it. Yeah, Councilwoman, anything that we can do to help put this thing to bed, I'm in favor of. Uh, so we have well, I'm bringing not sure up, that's going to do it. Yeah, but uh, uh, if if this would help do that, uh, then we certainly as staff support it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No close-ups. Yeah. Not comfortable with that much of a close-up. <clears throat> Hi, um, I know this is just a referral, but citizens don't get to speak usually at committee meetings or workshops, so uh, I just wanted to add a few things. Um, Matt Florel, um, I hope you all had a chance to read the report I put together on yellow signal timing and sent to you earlier this week. Uh, if you didn't get it, um, I have some extra copies. Uh, the one thing I wanted you to remember is the word minimum. Uh, I know Councilman Gertis already brought that up, uh, but at most of our red light camera approaches, we are using the bare minimum recommended yellow signal time. We do have the ability to raise that, and in several cases we have in the past. Uh, the data shows that those intersections have less people running red lights, uh, and that is uh, adjusted for traffic volume. I've read that there are supposedly issues with state DOT allowing us to raise signals above the minimum on state roads, um, but we have done it before, and there's actually a documented example recently of a city here in Florida doing that on a red light camera uh, intersection for the purposes of reducing red light running. About a year ago up in Milton, Florida, uh, they added an extra half second uh, to the yellow time uh, to the intersection of State Road 89 and Hamilton Bridge Road. The effect was an immediate drop in red light violations of 60%, which has been sustained over the last year. Uh, so it can be done, and it does work. Um, I was also going to mention uh, 34th Street. Uh, I believe that's, isn't that a U.S. highway? Is that a state highway? State highway. Okay. Um, we are testing yellow blinking lights uh, on 38th and 34th. Uh, I don't know if that's a deal. DOT program, or if that's something that you initiated, your department initiated, or? It's a DOT program that okay. uh, we're monitoring for application in the city. Okay. I, I was just going to mention, as long as we are doing things along 34th Street, um, there are eight red light cameras there. Six of them are operating at minimum. Uh, two of the highest uh, non-right turn citation uh, approaches are on that street. Uh, so why not just test on 34th Street? Um, that would be my suggestion. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And you are the one person today that did not use the maximum amount of time allowed. Uh, Councilmember Newton. Hey, Mr. Chair. Um, Joe, um, you said that the majority, uh, majority, if not all these cameras are on state roads. Yes. And F5 controls the intervals on those on those lights. Uh, yes, at intersections that are on state roads, the state has jurisdiction over the timing of the red lights. Well, so we, go, well, we work with them very closely, so, yeah. you know, but they ultimately have the, 
the yay or nay on, on what the signal tells me. So maybe go through this exercise and come back and say, hey, you should decrease it by one second. What kind of power does the city of St. Pierre have? I'm sorry, I didn't. I said, say we go through this exercise, this workshop, or the <laughs> PF and I, and come out with the fact that the city should reduce them by one second or half a second. What kind, of power, on, do, what kind of power do we have? Depends to, on the signal that uh, uh, it's at. If it's at a city street, we have the ability to do that. No, if it's at a state road, we would recommend it to DOT to consider, and DOT would decide. I was trying to finish. Uh, you, that's, well, that's my answer, but I was trying to finish the question. I'm saying right. it's, it, they're saying it's recommendation because that's all we can do with this red light camera program. We can't do anything but recommend to, to staff. So if it came back for a recommendation to increase the intervals of the air lights, all, all the city can do is recommend it to FDOT. That's pretty much it. Whatever, whatever you have red light cameras, is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying on state roads. We would recommend a change. We established those, so they'll certainly listen to us if we have good reasons to do it. Um, I feel comfortable that DOT would go along with our recommendation. And let me ask you, have there been any fatalities at these red light camera locations any at all? For some reason, I'm not hearing you. Very have well. there been any fatalities at these red light camera locations at all? No, there has not. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Dudley, last light. Thank you. Um, <laughs> getting exhaustive here doing this. Um, <clears throat> it might point out that uh, two things. One is the reason there is a time variance in the, uh, in the, the code for yellow lights is because of the size of intersections. And I think that's important to understand that not all intersections are the same, and you have to take that into account when you are putting the interval time in. And uh, I think it's good for the discussion. We, we need to have it. My second suggestion is we have somebody from the National Safety Council come in. Uh, well, you're exactly correct, and, and Councilman Gertis is too. Uh, the rules dealing with the yellow time interval establishes a formula that's a minimum time. Right. It does give an engineer, uh, the appropriate person, the ability to look at that intersection and modify it. I, I see that that's what he's asking us to do, is to take that's a look fine. at those and see if any of those circumstances exist here. If that's, uh, if that's the case, we would love to have a second opinion. And somebody with the National Safety Na Council. National Safety Council. Uh, I'll have to look into that further, but we'll certainly get qualified people to take a look at this. Well, they're, you know, uh, We work of, with them very closely. I just, yeah, I yeah. worked under those guys for a lot of years. Uh, mm -hmm. and they're pretty, I mean, they're, they do it nationally, and that's what they do. Safety I would is be very happy to get, invite them to be involved. Okay, thank you. We have a motion to refer to PSI. Yes. Roll call. Corbin? Yes. Cornell? Yes. Nurse? Yes. Newton? No. Danner? Yes. Curtis? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Yes. Motion passed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The remaining items we have, we have we have an attorney client session, but we're going to do that last. We have one legal item that we that we can take up in public. It's the settlement of William King versus the City of St. Pete. Yeah. Joe Patner won't show on that. Uh, crank. Uh, correct. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to, uh, Joe Powder, um, I'm here to uh, uh, request authorization to offer $35,000 in the case of uh, William King versus the City of St. Petersburg. It involves an uh, accident occurred in September 2010 where a, uh, one of our police cruisers struck an individual driving a scooter at the intersection of uh, Olmerton Road and 49th Street. Uh, I would point out in the last 48 hours that the that deal has become a little more tentative. Um, so it's not, it, it, while it says approval of a settlement on the, on the agenda, what I'm actually requesting you at this point is to authorize me to make that offer so I can have a firm offer to them. And I, I'm hopeful I'm still going to make it happen, but. Um, Move approval. Second. Council ever did. So it's an offer, not a settlement, as you as you briefed me on. I, I, I as I told, I, at the time I spoke to you, I believe, and, and some of the others, it was it looked like it was a firm deal. Since that time, in the last 24 to 48 hours, um, it's become a little more tentative. So it's not a firm deal, sir. But I, if this doesn't happen, what's our exposure? Uh, well, our exposure, of course, would be up to the sovereign immunity uh, cap. In this case, it would be $100,000 $100, if we were to trial and a verdict against us. Uh, I, I recommend uh, 
to me, based upon the situation I'm in in the case I rec and, and the medical bills, et cetera, I recommend that you give me the authority to offer the $35,000. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Yes. Cornell? Yes. Harris? Yes. You? Yes. Danner? Yes. Curtis? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Nothing. Yes. Thank you. I think we have one card for open forum. Mama T. Lassiter, today I'm here as a voice of the citizens of the Midtown community. They have been calling me, flagging me down as I drive by at the pharmacy because they want to know exactly what is going on at St. Pete College Midtown Campus. The community needs to know what are the plans for its future and if it truly includes them. Many are sharing not being able to obtain funding to continue their education. On last night, I was informed that Diana Timmons, the math tutor, which has been there for years, it was her last day due to the lack of money in the budget. She was the night tutor, which possessed patience and compassion in helping students achieve in various math. I was one of them. <laughs> also, where Midtown once allowed students to bring their children while they did their homework or received tutoring or counseling, it is not permitted anymore. Yet the new facility, the plan supposedly is to have a community room and space for their children. In addition, there are concerns about the lack of classes being offered in the evening when they could walk to class rather than struggle to get to downtown or Gibbs campuses. Why is it that once the city approved the 50-year lease of the land which was to be for houses and apartments. Now it is apparent that once Bill Law came here and got you all to give him what he wanted, he's not sharing with the community anymore. There have been no community meetings. What happened to the suggestion box? Why was the community stopped from accessing the computer in the lobby to do unemployment and food stamps and Medicaid applications as they did before? They no longer feel welcome or a part of the college anymore. As they watch others with vehicles come to classes and they live right in the immediate area and no one is there to assist them. St. Pete College placed an ATM machine in the break room and I had concerns when they did it. I questioned it and they told me it would be access and good for the community to be able to come and use it. However, the doors are locked. Dr. Shirley did not lock St. Pete College down, and her and Dr. Yvonne Umber, they understood that that campus had to be handled and ran a different way. We have many concerns, and I could go on and on, but time would not permit, so I'm going to give you the handout. But I would ask that the same way that you have brought Bayfront, you have brought the Housing Authority, you have brought uh, different entities and put them on the carpet to give you an update. The citizens that elected you all to office, we need to know exactly what is going on. And I really feel bad because it was I, and if you just give me one few seconds, because this is really serious. It was me that came to Baker and, and told Tish them that they was finna shut Mid Midtown down. It was me that got petitions. But whether Dr. Bill Law would admit it or not, he had listening posts at the campus. It was me that gave him the suggestion to build on that land and collaborate with Johnny Roof Clark because at the time I was going out there on 49th Street for classes and it was a young lady that was catching the bus home at 10 o'clock at night. And I figured if we had that building there and with Johnny Roof Clark working together, they could do internships. We have some real concerns at St. Pete College. If you don't believe me, go down there and watch. Last night, Wednesday night, is usually a busy night, including the employees, the janitors. It was only 37 cars in that parking lot. Okay. It used to be full. 
We have some issues. I'm going to leave it all for you because y'all only give me three months, three minutes. But the thing is, people are concerned. If you're not going to do the right thing, if Bill Law and them not going to do the right thing, just go ahead and cancel building it. We don't need brick and mortar if you won't allow us to utilize what y'all say is supposed to be there for us in the first place. Okay, okay. Tay, Tay the mayor has a light, so I presume he has some info. Well, I spoke to uh, Dr. Law last week, and there was a bid dispute. Um, in order to resolve that, they're going out to, uh, they're going to rebid yeah. the job. It'll add about 60 days uh, to the situation, but rather than uh, fight the dispute, and, and the dispute, part of it had had to do with, quite frankly, St. Pete College's uh, desire for local uh, contractors, local and minority hiring, and a and a commitment from the contractor to uh, to see that the, the the contracting skills and and much of that job was handled by locals. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just to make sure of the the clarity of, of of that going out in the new bid, that that'll be there. Uh, again, they're still firmly committed to uh, the construction of the 45,000-square-foot uh, school uh, next to the Mercy Hospital. Uh, but, yes, the project uh, <coughs> through the bidding process will be delayed about 60 days. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but we all addressed the other issues, uh, too. Yeah. That, that's, I knew about that, and I had talked to them. But it, it's bigger. You, I, you're talking I, about the I, citizens. I, you really had three minutes. I understand, I, I, but I it's see. about the citizen Connor. Which you would... say you was down there at the meeting with us, here. with Law Nim. I'm trying here. to make sure that y'all are going to address them things that I'm leaving here, here. about the students here. that's being affected, Ms. no funding. Ms. Lassiter, come on now. No, there's no Miss Lassiter to keep it real. I will, I will see. I'm just telling you, I'm leaving them, you, the thing hey. where I couldn't read it all, Carl, if you would listen. T, T, you know, you're, you're, well, you're well over the them, top. Give it to him. Thank you. But I know how to Thank do you. it. We know how to do it. When you come in the hood, we know how to do it. <laughs> Thank you. I only have three minutes. I couldn't read that fast. I was telling you, I, was give, I gave yes. half of them copy Thank you. for y'all to look at At this at time, I'm going to announce an attorney-client session. We'll commence following the reading of this announcement. We have, we have another speaker? Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, Matt Florell. They need to call you instead of me. I just wanted to mention that uh, in one hour, people's budget review will be out in front of City Hall. In the rain. Uh, in the rain or in the shine, with umbrellas, apparently, uh, asking citizens and, of course, city council members and city staff members are well, more than welcome uh, about your visions for the city. So I just wanted to announce that, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now then, at this time, I'm going to announce an attorney-client session will commence following the reading of this announcement involving the lawsuits styled Kathleen Ford, Fred DeBartlin, Gregory Canahan, Frank Carter Kearns, Joseph Reed, and Burton Klein versus the City of St. Petersburg, Florida, Inc., formerly known as 15,652 petitioners, and Kathleen Ford versus the City of St. Pete, case number 12-10312CI-19. It is estimated that this session will last 30 to 45 minutes. Any or all of the following persons will be attending this meeting. Carl Nurse, Chair, Bill Dudley, Vice Chair, Leslie Curran, Wingate Newt Newton, Charlie Gertis, James Kennedy, Steve Cornell, Jeff Danner, and Mayor Bill Foster, attorneys for the city, John C. Wolf, Mark Wynn, Joseph Pat Patner, J Jane Wallace. This meeting will be recorded by a certified recorder so this, we need to close the session and accept that those people named need, need to need to leave, and we will go to closed section.
6 p.m., the Pinellas County Juvenile Justice Coalition will have a, a doing, not a meeting, that's what we call them, at the Pinellas County Job Corps Center at 6 p.m. Uh, we hope that you would come down. We'll be discussing um, issues that, that are germane to the uh, juvenile justice and some of the treatment that's happened to them as it pertains to uh, Senate Bill 2112. Also, on Monday, uh, April the 8th, there will be a, a rally to tally uh, to advocate for the juvenile justice. Uh, transportation will be provided. You can call me, Councilman Newton, at 327 4664. That's 727 327 4664. This is a call to action. So, uh, will you answer the call for? our juveniles and our youth. Um, we're going up to have a big press conference and to try to uh, lobby uh, for support of these uh, bills as it pertains to the housing of these juveniles. Uh, if you don't know, Florida arrests 58,000 juveniles a year. Of that, 20,000 are charged as first-time offenders and uh, end up with backgrounds. And we're the only state that relinquishes juvenile records, so these young people go on to not be able to participate in the economic viability of your city as it pertains to jobs and we know the rest of the story. Uh, so we're just out there really advocating hard to make sure that uh, they get an opportunity to realize their full potential. So I welcome you to come out on Friday uh, at 6 p.m. to the Pinellas County Job Corps Center located at 500 22nd Street South. Um, that's the Pinellas <coughs> Juvenile Justice Coalition will meet then. And if you could spend the day on Monday, uh, we're making a trip to Tallahassee. We welcome the uh, support and transition will be provided. You can contact me. Again, 727-327-4664. Thank you. Council Member Kennedy. And I just wanted to remind everybody that our Rays are off to an exciting beginning of the season with a walk-off home run last night. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> in approximately two and a half hours, about 3 o'clock this afternoon, there will be a game over in Tropicana Field, rain or shine. That's right. Um, no rain outs? They're uh, Cleveland coming in this weekend. Um, and as the... Uh, Rays are basically saying if everybody goes to one more game a year, that will be of great assistance to the attendance. We encourage all our citizens in St. Pete and the region to attend the games. Thank you. That was quite a game last night. Go ahead. Lumber Cornell. Yeah. Um, after our discussion last week, or the, our last council meeting, which was two weeks ago, actually, uh, Bank of America contacted me. And on April 17th and 18th, they have scheduled a workshop at Carillon Hilton in St. Petersburg for um, people to come in and talk to them about their foreclosures. They, um, the sad news about this is they've done several of these and had very low attendance. So what I've done is gotten with our housing staff, gotten a list. There's 600 people in St. Petersburg or surrounding areas that are in some form of foreclosure with Bank of America. And the gentleman from Bank, the executive from Bank of America that met with me uh, said they could use help getting people in there. So uh, it's April 17th and 18th at Carillon Hilton, and I don't have the Bank of America number handy right here, so what I'll do is tell people out there to call me at the office, 893-7117, and I'll make sure you get the information. But um, I really want to encourage people. I know it's embarrassing, and I know it's humiliating and, and degrading in many ways when you're going through the possibility of losing your home, but do speak up. Uh, do come out and talk to the bank because there is a possibility that your home can be saved. Um, I've also worked with uh, some of the people who helped me on my campaign, and we're going to be making 600 uh, calls or knocking on doors if we don't have phone numbers for people that are in foreclosure with Bank of America to let them know about this. Um, I think it's really important. I, th I can't think of anything more important that we could do. Um, so if you want to help with that, again, call my the office, 893-7117. But I hope that uh, our citizens will turn out for this workshop. I think it's a, a really good step. And uh, to give credit where credit is due, Bank of America already had it scheduled. So I'm just helping them publicize it. Thank you. Thank you. Health Member Danner. Just want to uh, briefly remind everyone when the, uh, you're out at the gallery walk a week from Saturday the 13th, riding the trolleys, you'll have a chance to see the community bus plan exhibition. Um, it didn't say which gallery it was at, so you'll probably have to go to all of them to find it. But the <laughs> trolleys run downtown Central Avenue and then into Warehouse District. So um, take advantage of that opportunity to do both of those things that evening. Council Member Kerr. That's what I was going to say. Okay. And the mayor. But to be judicious of your time, um, Mr. Chair, as soon as you adjourn this meeting, uh, if we can clear the public, we can do an executive session meeting. It'll be very short. 
we can do it in here so nobody has to leave and it shouldn't take long. And that will keep all of you from having to come back at 1.30. It will be very quick. Is that okay for folks? Okay. That's okay. what we'll, we'll do. Yeah. No. Uh, no. It won't okay. be that long. Okay. The uh, final thing I wanted to mention is the uh, school system has allowed a new program called the Summer Bridge, which I think they actually have room for 30,000 students. It's, uh, it's six weeks of learning in the summertime. It's free. Only 2,100 folks have signed up so far. You can visit their website, which is Pinellas <coughs> County School Board, PCSB.org, or the, the, the office of, of, of your school. I would really encourage folks. It's a, it's a, it's a really innovative program that has uh, real potential to, to reduce the summer loss that we typically have. And with that,